conducting this uh, meeting in light of the uh, emergency circumstances that we continue to operate under. And I'll note that this meeting of the Pacifica Planning Commission will be conducted pursuant to the provisions of Government Code Section 54953, as amended by AB 361, which authorizes teleconference meetings under the Brown Act during certain proclaimed states of emergency. The Governor of California proclaimed a state of emergency related to COVID-19 on March 4th, 2020. This teleconference meeting is necessary so that the city can conduct essential business and is permitted under Government Code Section 54953 in order to protect public health and safety of attendees. Consistent with Government Code Section 54953, this Planning Commission meeting will be held via teleconference only, and there will be no physical location open to the public. Planning commissioners and staff will teleconference into the meeting by audio and or video. The public can observe the meeting remotely via the Zoom link as the primary means of participation or via cable channel 26 or live stream broadcasts as alternate methods of viewing the meeting. Participation via the Zoom link will enable the meeting to be observed live and will enable the public to speak during public comment periods. The Zoom link was published in the meeting agenda. Live public comments are being accepted at this meeting. Public comments may, may be provided live by members of the public utilizing the Zoom link to participate in the meeting. Utilize the raise hand function in Zoom, uh, in the Zoom application on a computer, smartphone, or tablet, or else enter star nine to raise your hand if you're dialing in by phone. Please ensure your name is correctly entered in your Zoom profile so city staff may properly identify you when it's your turn to speak. Those dialing in by phone will be called to speak by the last four digits of their phone number as shown on the Zoom interface. With that said, we'll go ahead then and move to the, um, uh, the, the agenda proper and we'll start please with the roll call. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Berman. Present. Commissioner Domerat. Present. Commissioner Ferguson. I will note for the record, Commissioner Ferguson is present, but having audio difficulty. Commissioner Godwin. Present. Commissioner Hauser. Present. Commissioner Leal. Present. Commissioner Nibblin. Here. Thank you. So we'll then move to a salute to the flag and I'll ask that uh, Commissioner uh, Hauser, uh, lead us in the salute to the flag tonight, this evening. Thank you, Chair. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm sorry, I was uh, muted there. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, administrative business. And before we take up the, the various points of administrative business, I wanna go ahead and see if we have public comment uh, regarding any of these items of administrative business. So I'll ask Mr. Murdoch to help us uh, identify whether we have public comment as to administrative business. There are no hands raised, Chair. Thank you. There being no public comment, we'll go ahead then and move to the uh, administrative business items. The first uh, item of administrative business is approval of the order of agenda. I'll ask whether or not there is a motion to uh, approve the um, order of agenda. Commissioner Godwin. I move we, have, we approve the order of agenda as written. Thank you. We have a motion to approve the order of agenda as written. Uh, Commissioner Hauser. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Could we please get a roll call vote? Commissioner Berman. Yes. Commissioner Domerat. Yes. Commissioner Ferguson. Yes. Commissioner Godwin. Yes. Commissioner Hauser. Yes. Commissioner Leal. Yes. Commissioner Niblin. Yes. And that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. So the next item of, of administrative business is approval of our uh, the minutes from our meeting of November 15th, uh, 2021. And uh, I'll ask uh, my colleagues whether or not there are any comments or uh, concerns regarding the minutes and or uh, a motion uh, to approve the minutes. Commissioner Berman. 
I move that we approve the November 15th, 2021 minutes. Thank you. Commissioner Berman has uh, moved that we approve the minutes of November 15th, 2021's meeting. Is there a second? Commissioner Leal? Second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can we please get a roll call vote? Commissioner Berman? Yes. Commissioner Damarat? Yes. Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Godwin? Yes. Commissioner Hauser? Yes. Commissioner Leal? Yes. Commissioner Niblin? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And I'll confirm that we don't need uh, to designate a liaison to the city council meeting. That's correct, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch. Uh, oral communications then. This is the portion of the agenda that's available to the pub that is available to the public to address the planning commission on any issue within the subject matter jurisdiction of the commission that is not on the agenda. The time allowed for any speaker this evening will be three minutes. I'll ask if there's any oral communication. Mr. Murdoch, if you could help us with that. Yes, uh, there are uh, multiple hands raised, Chair. So we will start with Jim Kramer. Thank you, Mr. Kramer, please go ahead. Yes, I'm unmuted, can you hear me? We can hear you, sir, go ahead. That's great. I'd like to uh, share a quote, a brief quote, that I hope the uh, commissioners will find interesting. The city manager, <clears throat> quote, the city manager told the council again Wednesday that the plan revision really is the quote, last chance, unquote, for Pacifica to make up its mind, comma, set up rules and guidelines and let its business and commercial base catch up with the bedrooms. Homes, the manager said, has reached, Homes, he restated, he reiterated, have proved to be incapable of meeting the cost of local government, close quotes. So this is a little bit of levity, I hope. Uh, that quote is from 1976, and the city manager was Don Wiedner, and we're still worrying about whether the uh, cost of, whether residential building will help the financial status of the city. And in, in 1972, they were pretty sure it didn't, and some people feel that way now. So it's sort of an overriding point that we're seeing a lot of the same issues recurring, and we've, I appreciate the work that you all do, and I just thought you might like to hear that old quote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. Uh, next speaker, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, while I'm getting that speaker ready to talk, I just want to note uh, the Zoom application is not allowing me to share my screen to show the timer, uh, but please note that the timer is running in the background to uh, keep track of the three-minute time limit. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch. Uh, the next speaker is Christine Bowles. Please go ahead. Um, good evening, commissioners and staff. This is Christine Bowles. Um, I want to thank the city for issuing the draft general plan documents. Um, I really am struggling to navigate the review of these enormous documents, though. Um, I spent three hours on Sunday morning trying to study greenhouse gas emissions, for example, uh, in relation to previous comments by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and was so frustrated in the end that I just gave up. I couldn't even figure out what current science was being used in the analysis as the EIR bibliography and general plan information did not match and neither matched what the air quality district called for. I've already pointed out emissions in the landslide, <clears throat> excuse me, catching my breath, in the landslide and fire hazard maps as well. I honestly don't know how to proceed with my review at this point with these kinds of major discrepancies and I'm hoping for some guidance from you all tonight. Um, I really don't understand how we can be reviewing uh, land use policy changes without a proper understanding of our hazards as a very first um, thing to look at and understand. There's a lot of good in the general plan draft and I hope that we can find a way to move forward past these first hiccups so that we can all make the best use of our very limited time that the city has allowed. We only have 34 days left and counting. I'm very happy to read in the EIR that the importance of the Hillside Preservation Ordinance is affirmed and that it calls for the addition of new parcels to the HPD maps. As I've shared with you previously, this is in keeping with the original intent of the HPD Ordinance written in 1972 and also consistent with policy SA 1-11 to prevent development related to grading and vegetation clearance on slopes steeper than 35%. It'll be interesting to hear how that development on a project in HPD with an average slope of 55% is debated later on tonight. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Ms. Bowles. Next speaker is 
Cliff Lawrence, please go ahead. Hello, uh, I, I think I'm not alone in uh, wanting to be, I'm grateful that we finally have the documents. Um, they are uh, substantially larger than we were anticipating. Uh, they also come without indexing as previous documents offered to the public have. So um, I've uh, submitted some comments and uh, I'll share this with you. I got a note back pretty much said, well, uh, we got your note, uh, but we can't talk with you about this because it's under consideration by the council. So what I take away from this is that uh, this is not gonna be a collaborative effort. Uh, we're saying the public has a, uh, a role here. Uh, it's unclear what that role, what, what role you're all going to allow that to be. Uh, I feel that uh, I've just heard somebody lawyer up and say, we can't talk. How can I do something collaboratively? I can find things that are mistakes and there are city people who know that I do that routinely. It's just a gift I have. But nobody's gonna work with me so that I can help the city make this a better document. We all wanna make this a better document. My real concern here and elsewhere is what's happening with we the people. Are we the people still in charge? And why are my elective representatives not being responsive? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Um, next uh, speaker, please. Next speaker is Janine Marquardt. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, this is my first time attending and I'm here with my husband, Rob. Uh, it does sound like there's been a lot of work being done on the proposed home at the top of Talbot. I don't know if that's what everybody previously has been speaking about. We are the new owners of 722 Talbot as of the end of last year. So we now have an interest in the proceedings with the home being built or proposed to be built next door. So this is our first time here attending, wanting to just hear what the conversation is and we appreciate the opportunity to have reviewed the documents in advance. So thank you all for your work over the last several years on this and we look forward to seeing how things turn out. Thank you, Ms. Marquardt. Next speaker, please. The next speaker is Suzanne Moore, please go ahead. Good evening, commissioners. Suzanne Moore from the Manor, and like many in Pacifica, I'm grateful to have access to the updated drafts of the general plan and the environmental impact report. And like many, I'm finding it unwieldy and I haven't been able to study it as I would like. I know others have commented already that the impact report lacks a table of contents and page numbers, and it's difficult to copy it to your own files so that you can study what you need. It's not interactive and you have to tediously scroll down. Um, so I'm um, asking uh, this commission to please use your influence and help create this document, a reflection of our community vision and a resource that can be easily accessed by all. Thank you this evening. Uh, thank you, Ms. Moore. Uh, next speaker, please. The next speaker is Aaron Macias. Please go ahead. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Good evening, this is Erin Macias of Lindemar. Um, I also wanted to comment on the general plan draft. Um, the last version of the draft that was presented to the residents had basically red lines and visible edits. Um, I concur with the comments of the other speakers that it is very difficult to navigate. Um, I also, just kind of doing some basic math, and it, if I were to review the EIR, which is 1,000, uh, 13 pages, I would have to read 22 pages a day to be able to get to that 45 day marker. And then that doesn't include the 299 pages of the plan itself. I genuinely care about my city. I care about the long-term goals of our city and I already see some major flaws. Um, I would like this to be a open dialogue, a two-way process that 
engages the public. I don't think 45 days is sufficient time for public comment. That's my first concern. Um, I also hope that, you know, without reservation, each of you can say in your heart of hearts that you have read every single page of both the plan and the EIR because you're voting on planning decisions that permanently alter the city of Pacifica. And if you haven't read through the entire document, how are you making informed decisions about our future and the impact of those developments? So I really value your time because I know it's a huge commitment to step up to the plate. Not everybody can do that. And to become a, a planning commissioner, it's a huge responsibility and it's a very large time commitment. I value that. Um, I'm just asking you to please understand the seriousness of this document. This is a major change for the city of Pacifica. And it would be really nice if we could see the progression from the old into the new, because we've seen drafts. One minute remaining. Uh, we've seen drafts before, and this one is very, very difficult to digest and interpret. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Macias. Uh, Mr. Murdoch, uh, any other speakers? Yes, Chair, there's one more hand raised. Uh, the next speaker will be Tara, and if you could please state your full name for our records, we'd appreciate it. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Tara Knotts. Um, I am a resident up in the Fairmont area, Pacifica. I am not terribly uh, experienced at looking at planning documents and don't know a ton about this, but what I was looking for in this document was a general feel for the understanding of the protection of the wildlife in, the, in both in our, in our own neighborhoods and our own streets and then um, that that which just surrounds us and goes down into the the protected area the land the um crystal springs and downward down down san mateo down san mateo county and um i certainly noticed that there's an area that talks about a wildlife corridor um near sharp park um, i don't see a lot of other discussion about protecting the passages of animals to and from and through streets and we obviously have many many encounters with mountain lions, deer, bobcats, coyotes, and it's just going to get more and more as time goes on. And I guess I just don't have a good feel for making sure that those, those on your committee are really understanding um, those large mammals and their needs and their growth, their predicted growth. Um, and as we build, we if we build near, um, Near near undeveloped areas, undeveloped areas, and uh, the protect near that protected areas, we're going to be squeezing them more and more, as are our neighbors and neighboring cities. So I just would like to make sure we are consulting groups that really understand the large animals, particularly the cats, such as the Puma Project and uh, Simper Voices. Um, I sent an email with public comment with um, a link to one of those pieces of information. And I just hope that the, um, that you that are voting um, really understand um, the, the implications of uh, squeezing the animals that need to be protected down all the way down San Mateo County. Thank you, Ms. Knox. Uh, Mr. Murdoch, any other public comment? Yes, Chair, another hand went up uh, while Tara was speaking. So Jim Nichols, please go ahead. Mr. Nichols, we can't hear you. <clears throat> we can't hear you from talking. Sorry, how about now? Yes, now. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you can hear me? Okay, thanks. Yes, Sorry. please go ahead. Please go ahead. Sorry. Oh, okay, so Jim Nichols here, uh, 700 Talbot. I live approximately two houses down the hill from this new project. And uh, you know, I, actually, Mr. Nichols, I, I'm sorry, you know, I, I kind of let something get past me last time. This is actually a, a portion of the agenda for, for items that are not on the agenda. And uh, okay, sorry. the matter that you're looking to talk to is actually on the agenda. So it might be more appropriate and probably more effective if you just hold your uh, comment until we're considering the yeah. item. Sorry. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. I just, I just wanted to clarify that for us. Thank you. Um, Mr. Murdoch, any other comments? No other hands are raised, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for the public comment this evening. A, a lot of input on the general plan. Um, so we'll uh, go ahead then and uh, move from uh, oral communication to um, consent items. I see that we have none. Uh, so we'll move past that. And that'll take us to a continued public hearing. Again, the, the matter we were just talking about a few seconds ago, and that is uh, 
file number 2018-057, general plan amendment GPA 121, rezoning RZ20118, development plan DP7918, specific plan SP16918, variance PV52618, parking exception PE19121, uh, filed by the Murphys for general plan land use designation change to very low density residential, rezoning to PD, which is planned development, HPD, Hillside Preservation District, zoning districts, authorization for a single family residential use, and construction of a 2,406 square foot single family residence with a two car garage on an undeveloped parcel at the eastern terminus of Talbot Avenue in Pacifica. Uh, Let's see here. The um, recommended CEQA action is a class three categorical exemption, CEQA guidelines, uh, section 15303. And recommended action for us from staff is the, that we adopt uh, a resolution to approve the development permits as conditioned and recommend the city council approval of the general plan amendment, rezoning and development plan. And uh, Mr. Murdoch, I'll go ahead and uh, ask you to sort of uh, help us get a staff report. For you to Thank you, Chair. Good evening, honorable commissioners. I'm Deputy Planning Director Christian Murdoch. This item is a continued public hearing from August 2nd, 2021, at which time the commission heard staff and applicant presentations and public testimony before deliberating on the project. The commission determined at that time a continuance was needed to allow evaluation of certain aspects of the project. These included a request for visual renderings from specific vantage points, an analysis of the applicant's ability to provide guest parking uh, as required by the HPD or Hillside Preservation District zoning regulations, evaluation of the ability to move a flow through planter designed for stormwater treatment out of a PG&E easement and the status of the unofficial trail on the project site. Staff has provided a detailed response to each of these items in the staff report. The applicant has provided the requested renderings, has demonstrated its ability to provide the guest parking space if desired by the commission, and has relocated the flow through planter. Staff has determined no formalized right of public access appears to be present on the project site for the trail in question and has determined that no mechanism exists to obtain a formal public right for trail access as part of this project review process. With the information to address the items previously identified by the Planning Commission, staff believes it is appropriate to again consider the project. Staff's recommendation is to approve the project as conditioned and to grant the variance and parking exception to deviate from providing the required off-street parking space as further described in the staff report. Staff has also prepared an alternate motion for approval in the event that the Planning Commission determines that the variance and parking exception from the guest parking requirement should not be approved and would make conforming edits to the approval resolution to reflect that action. And I should note that any action by the Planning Commission to uh, approve the project would also include a recommendation to the City Council to approve conforming uh, zoning uh, amendment and general plan amendment as well as approval of a development plan uh, for the project as required by the PD or plan development zoning. So that concludes my presentation and, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I, I just have a, maybe a process question for yourself and maybe for Mr. Messenger, uh, just in terms of uh, it, this being a continued item and we, we sometimes do have continued items, but, uh, and I, I'm understanding that we'll take public comment on it, but uh, is it appropriate um, to take, to again, give the applicant the opportunity to, to speak to the matter um, kind of as we would if the matter were coming um, sort of initially, or um, I don't know if uh, you or Mr. Messenger have any thoughts on kind of the best process. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if the he public hearing was continued open, then it would be appropriate to allow the applicant to offer more uh, testimony and evidence in support of his application, as well as any others that may wish to speak in favor or against the, uh, the application. Well, my recollection, I'll ask my colleagues to perhaps uh, verify is that we, we took public comment and uh, well, we took comment from the applicant and then from the public and then we uh, closed the, uh, then we closed the matter and brought it back to the commission at which point we um, decided there were some additional items we wanted uh, information on. Um, I know that we probably got prerogative to, you know, decide how we might want to proceed in terms of taking additional comment, but uh, and uh, a point, Mr. Chairman, uh, that I, I'll defer to Mr. Murdoch. I, it, it also would depend on whether the item had been advertised as a new public hearing, and, and I, I don't recall the answer to that, and perhaps Mr. Murdoch can help us with that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Messinger. Uh, so uh, to be clear, uh, regarding how we noticed the public hearing, uh, we did not uh, specify and do not typically specify whether it's a new or continued public hearing when we publish 
a legal advertisement for a public hearing. Um, I would just uh, make my recommendation to uh, reopen the public hearing provided Mr. Messenger is uh, open to that uh, because there is new information in the record related to the uh, vantage point renderings uh, and certain other new information that the applicant and or the public may uh, appreciate having the opportunity to comment on. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And as long as my colleagues are in agreement with it, my, my thought was to allow the uh, applicant the opportunity to um, to speak to the additional information that uh, has come to us and, and frankly, to allow the public to comment. I My, my inclination would be, frankly, uh, to maybe, given what I anticipate is going to be a lot of interest in speaking to the item, maybe to reduce the amount of time for public comment to two minutes from three and, and to really kind of ask folks that they perhaps can you know consider really focusing on the new information, recognizing that we received an awful lot of comment and uh, information the, uh, at the first hearing. So that would be my, my thinking. And the other thought that occurred to me is it might be nice before we sort of launch into public comment. I know the renderings were, were quite important, I, you know, maybe even to, to, to share the renderings, maybe ask uh, Ms. Agarwal or somebody who's, who's able to, to perhaps even share the renderings that we, um, that we received in our packet, just so that uh, everybody has the opportunity to, to see all that. And with that, I'll ask if my colleagues have anything additional they'd like to ask or add. Uh, Commissioner Hauser. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a, a general comment that I feel like I'm going to say on every item, but I, I would really appreciate, um, and I, I love the idea, Chair, of putting the renderings up. I would really appreciate some type of graphic or visual to orient the commission and the public um, on, on items. If, if it's a map or a rendering, we have those. So I think it would be really helpful to see those in the future when staff is presenting. Thank you. I know Mr. Murdoch this evening is having some trouble sharing um, uh, via Zoom, so we may have to get that done a different way. I'm sure that would have been the ordinary process here. I don't, you know, we're, we're all fighting the technology. So, um, um, so we have. Uh, thank you for that comment. Any other comments from um, from commissioners before we uh, move along, or any, any points of clarification with respect to Mr. Murdoch's uh, report uh, that's been shared? Okay. Well, maybe what we'll do then is go ahead and uh, move to the applicant, and maybe the applicant could uh, use the opportunity to um, to maybe share the renderings. Uh, I'd ask maybe the applicant to sort of try to work that into um, presentation. And, and again, we'll uh, given that we're going to ask the applicant to maybe do some of the uh, the work of, <laughs> that we'd otherwise want done anyway. We'll afford ten minutes for um, for the applicant, uh, up to ten minutes to to, to speak to the uh, into the to the new information at hand. Thank you, Chair. I'm bringing over the uh, applicant at this point in time. It'll just be a moment. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch. And so I've just brought over a participant uh, identified only as Murphy. Uh, once you're brought in as a panelist, can you please confirm that uh, you're the applicant, Murphy? Hello. Uh, hello, Murphy family. Okay, that is the Murphys. Stand up. <laughs> There's Matthew. Okay. okay. Hi, this is Oz. My name is Brendan Murphy. And this is my family. We are hoping to build our family home on this project site at the end of Talbot Avenue. The home we are proposing is a modest family home of about 2,500 square feet. It's a little bit less. It is not a mansion designed for the super rich. It is just uh, intended for ourselves, and it's a family home. We hope to build this home and make Pacifica our new community. My dad lives about one block away from the project site, and in visiting him over the years, we have come to realize what a wonderful town Pacifica is. Our dream is now to be part of this community and to live one block up the street from my kid's granddad. For more than three years, we have worked amending our plans as needed to finally arrive at this hearing tonight. <laughs> this has been a long and arduous process, uh, and we sincerely hope that the Planning Commission can bring our project to a vote tonight. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Murphy family. Um, Mr. Chavarria, maybe you'll uh, have some additional to, uh, to, to share at this point. Um, good evening, commissioners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this matter. 
Um, I really would have very little to add, uh, except that uh, we have designed the project following all the guidelines, uh, adjusting it per the requirements of the planning department and the requirements of the fire departments and all the different plan review processes that we've gone. Um, I feel that we have uh, complied also with the additional requirements that the commission made, uh, in fact, of, uh, if preparing renderings, adding a parking space, um, modifying uh, the drainage system. Um, so at this point, um, I feel that from the technical standpoint, um, we have designed a good project. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a challenging site indeed. Um, nevertheless, uh, uh, the design has taken into, a, into consideration those challenges to create a project that will be sound, safe, and an enhancement for the community. Um, I'm available for any questions that you may have, and I'll be happy to respond if I can. Thank you. Um, again, I was hoping that somebody uh, would be able to, and I, I know that some of the commissioners feel the same way, would be able to share the renderings that you were just referring to. I know a lot of effort went into that. So, uh, Ms. Agarwal, thank you. And so maybe maybe somebody could provide some um, some commentary as to what we're looking at as well. I know it's kind of marked, but um, anything that might be... Uh, appropriate to add. Chair, I'll just clarify, certainly staff is uh, is willing and ready to do that uh, when the applicant's time is completed, but I don't want to eat into their, their 10 minutes until their public uh, comment opportunity is concluded. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ch uh, Chavarria, anything else for... Um, um, I would applicant? certainly defer to staff. Um, you know, as I said, we feel that we have uh, provided all the information. Um, the renderings are, we believe, self-explanatory. Um, so we would rather answer any questions that you have or respond to any concerns thereafter. But at this point, there's really very little else that we can add. Thank you. I think what I'd ask uh, commissioners then is if we go ahead and maybe walk through the renderings again, just so we get that done. And then um, if there are questions for the applicant, uh, we can either ask them now or hold them until after we hear from the public and uh, just sort of deal with questions uh, at that time. So uh, maybe staff could go ahead and walk us through the renderings. Yeah, Ms. Agarwal, I'll, I'll go first, and then you can please add anything that uh, I may have left out. Uh, the commission asked, it, uh, asked for uh, three vantage points in particular, uh, one from the Grace McCarthy Scenic Overlook along Sharp Park Road, uh, one vantage point from uh, Malagra Ridge from the public uh, trail areas uh, in, uh, to the north of the project site, uh, a vantage point from the cul-de-sac at the east end of Canyon Drive, and then the applicant provided a fourth vantage point uh, from uh, the eastern terminus of Talbot, uh, which is where the project site uh, would be accessed and where the construction would occur. And so uh, we can go back to any and all of these as the commission desires to understand the renderings. Um, the commission didn't uh, provide any particular uh, criteria for the renderings other than to show what the home would look like uh, as positioned on the project site. I think in particular in light of the, the topography of the site, and so staff doesn't have uh, too much to add to that. It's really a, a determination of each commissioner um, as to the relationship of the property uh, to the project site. As we noted uh, in the staff report, it is a very steep site. This home is built as much on the least steep portions of the site as possible, but due to the PG&E easement comprising the southern 50 feet on the project site, which is the flattest portion, uh, unfortunately, uh, to achieve economic use of this site, uh, this home is, is positioned in part on um, some relatively steep uh, topography. And so uh, the only final uh, comment on the renderings from my perspective, um, Ms. Agarwal, can you go to the rendering from uh, Malagra Ridge? Uh, it's just to note that uh, even given the, the foggy uh, conditions that occurred when the, the applicant took the picture to create the rendering, um, it doesn't reflect uh, additional landscaping uh, that may be included with the project as proposed in the final landscape plan, which uh, could further soften and screen the uh, the building and, and complement the architecture and design of the site. Thank you. So I'll, I guess at this point, I'll, I'll ask my uh, colleagues, that would it be um, appropriate, okay, to go ahead and maybe uh, take public comment and then sort of um, ask any comments or questions that we, we have? Or uh, Commissioner Berman, go ahead. Thank you. I, I do want to ask one of my questions while we have the renderings on the screen, because it relates to the renderings. Um, 
the rendering number three, I guess it relates to this one as well, but rendering number three, um, if that, yes, exactly. So here I appreciate, I think, yeah, they're renderings of trees. Um, I appreciate the landscaping that helps screen the, the new home from kind of invading visually in the backyard of the home in the foreground. But given the slopes of the site, is it going to be feasible to plant substantial trees at this location? But I think oh, perhaps that's a question for the applicant. Uh, they identified the tree species that were proposed uh, and they can maybe elaborate on the, the thought process that went into those particular tree species. Okay, uh, then I'll direct my question to the applicant. Uh, yes, uh, initially we had thought uh, of planting, it, at some of the initial meetings it was uh, discussed um, whether some screening could be done and we have proposed uh, some larger trees. Um, the soils engineer recommended against uh, planting uh, larger trees as they could be detrimental uh, to the performance of the hillside. So therefore the idea was abandoned. Uh, the trees that we see there uh, were trees uh, that were existing at the time that the photograph was taken and the home is sitting behind that. If you see the trees to the right of the home um, are very similar to the ones that are in the back. So that is uh, existing vegetation, not proposed vegetation. It, and if uh, by accident any of the original trees that we had proposed uh, was left in there, per perhaps uh, the one to the very left uh, of the proposed home, um, that is definitely not our intent to put any big trees along that section. So the planting will be more in line to what our soils engineer recommended, which is uh, shrubbery, ground coverage uh, and vegetation that does not uh, um, uh, uh, grow too, too big. Okay, sorry, my eyes are probably terrible and I can't tell the difference between an existing tree and a rendering of a tree. But so you said that only the one tree shown on the left is a rendering and the rest are existing? It and I, I, I did not prepare the renderings uh, myself. Uh, there was a company that was hired to do that, and we went through several iterations. My understanding is that the row of trees that are immediately behind the home are very similar to the ones on the right side, which are uh, trees that were uh, existing on the original conditions. And if I am erroneous on that, um, our intent is not to plant any additional trees uh, from what the current conditions are. Okay, and then I, I guess I would, effectively what I'm trying to figure out is, are there going to be trees to help kind of screen the house from Canyon Drive and also kind of visually screen for privacy the homes that are directly downhill of the house? It's, it's kind of a catch-22. Uh, we were initially, um, in fact, through the planning process, um, the planning department has re suggested and, and uh, that we planted some trees, but on the previous meeting, uh, it was uh, brought up uh, by the public that the trees may not be the best alternative for the hillside. Mm -hmm. We consulted with our geotechnical engineer and with people that are uh, technically able to make such a determination. And it was established that large trees will bring root deeper into the hillside that may create a problem with erosion. And um, so therefore, there was a balancing act. Do we provide a screening? Do we create um, negative impacts on the hillside? So our final approach is we are not going to plant any big trees. We are going to create shrubbery. Uh, that are more into the native type of species in there that will definitely shield the lower portion of the building, but it will not grow tall. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I certainly agree that it shouldn't be um, 
sought after to plant large trees on a steep slope. I certainly agree with that. I'm just trying to understand the the visual privacy and and this rendering with what trees are already there. Um, but I I think that's that's sufficient for now. Thank you, and Commissioner Berman. I think I need to add that uh, on packet page. 158 the applicant's landscape plan does indicate tree plantings in that location and so i think we will want clarification if the applicant is seeking to formally amend its application uh, to remove those trees or to replace them with different species but currently they're proposed uh six or seven uh, arbutus marina or, or strawberry trees uh, in that location which are not generally you know particularly large trees but they would provide some screening benefit uh, and that that is the the information that staff has used to evaluate the project. So I think we need clarification from the applicant. Okay, I will support that clarification request. Okay, um, Charlie, why don't you go ahead with that? Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, we certainly want to do uh, what is right for the project from the technical standpoint, from the visual standpoint. Um, along the process, we have had. Uh, initial request for screening, that's when the trees were proposed. Um, I, I believe that uh, the project can be conditioned to have a type of tree that our geologist, uh, the peer reviewer, as well as the landscape architect established that are trees that will not grow too tall, that will not be detrimental uh, to the hillside. Uh, and I think that uh, from our standpoint, that would be perfectly acceptable. We want to do what is right for the project, slope stability-wise, screening-wise, without compromising either one. Thank you, Mr. Chavarri. And I just want to clarify for the commission as well, on packet page 51, uh, it's exactly with what Mr. Chavarri had just stated, that staff uh, prepared condition of approval number 10. And so uh, it's a, a fairly standard condition related to the final landscape plan. But we did specifically add language that says, Quote, the project ge geotechnical engineers shall confirm in writing prior to issuance of a building or grading permit that all proposed plantings and any proposed irrigation system would be consistent with his or her recommendations to maintain slope stability, including but not limited to the recommendation to avoid excessive irrigation in order to pervert, preserve st slope stability. In the event an irrigation system is not proposed, the applicant shall provide a written statement by a licensed landscape architect that the proposed plantings can be successfully established without the installation of a permanent irrigation system, end quote. And the condition goes on from there. Uh, and so we have taken into account the relationship between plantings, screening, and slope stability, and taken what we felt was a re reasonable measure to uh, obtain written confirmation that the plantings are acceptable uh, and would ensure slope stability. So to that end, we've, we've taken steps, uh, but we, we can certainly to modify it to suit the commission's desires. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch. Um, my personal opinion is slope stability will win over planting any day, um, but I'm looking forward to deliberating with the fellow commissioners. Uh, if it pleases the commission, I can possibly share a Google image of what it looks like right now, uh, if it is helpful. You go that ahead? would be very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Got it. Is, is it visible? Yep. Yeah. Very useful. Thank you. Thank you. I think what we'll do then, Mr. Murdoch, is we can go ahead and um, I think drop that image and we'll just go ahead then and um, I think move to um, public comment. Again, I, I, it's my proposal we go ahead and take two minutes of public comment. Again, my hope is it will be primarily focused on matters that uh, weren't uh, addressed at the uh, time of the last hearing, you know, given the additional information that we, uh, we now have. But in any event, uh, we'll have two minutes per speaker. Thank you, Chair. There are some hands raised. And before I uh, call the speakers in, I just want to remind uh, the public that I am having difficulty sharing my screen to show the timer, but I will be timing in the background to keep track of the two-minute time limit. And I will provide a reminder with one minute remaining. So with that stated, uh, Kurt Keist, please go ahead. 
Okay, thank you. My name is Kurt Keast, and I live at 630 Talbot, six uh, houses below the proposed um, uh, house by the Murphys. I strongly support allowing Mr. Murphy and his family to build this house. Um, and I've discussed this with multiple of my neighbors, uh, my wife, and we're all uh, very much uh, in the mode of saying, let this guy build his house. And the reason is when I moved here 33 years ago, I knew that this was zoned R1. I knew it had an HPD uh, overlay. And I knew that a single family home would be able to be built. If somebody wanted to build a hotel up there or a commercial property or something like that, I would be protesting. And I protested the construction of uh, the elaborate 9,000 square foot Pope's residence at Gypsy Hill across the way. But when people want to follow their normal uh, rights as a property owner, and I can expect them to build it, um, more power to them. So I welcome the Murphys uh, to the uh, thing. I think it would be a travesty if uh, for any reason you guys either postponed this project, it's been going on for over three years, it's nearly four years. Um, and um, if, you know, I don't have no idea what Mr. Murphy would do, but I would take uh, this uh, city to court for an adverse taking if, if you denied his uh, opportunity to build a modest, very simple, very nicely designed home. They've done, they've been over backwards. They've jumped through hoops to make this happen. And it, for me, it would be ridiculous to deny him his uh, approval. There are other factors going on in this city right now. There are big developments, in big areas, but that is not the problem. Thank, thank you, Mr. Keyes. Thank you, Mr. Keyes. We're at two minutes, so I appreciate your, uh, your comments. No uh, next uh, speaker, please. Thank you, Chair. As I bring in the next speaker, I do also need to state that uh, we did receive one public comment in writing prior to the hearing, but after agenda packet publication, which was posted on the city's website, made available in the planning department, uh, and uh, also uh, shared with the commissioners. Uh, so the Thank next you, speaker Mr. is Janine Marquardt. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you. Uh, nice to meet you all, um, future neighbors, Murphys. Um, as, as stated earlier, hi. Um, we did just recently purchase 722 Talbot and are looking forward to moving in there in a few weeks. And uh, in reading through the plans and everything else, the only concern I had, and maybe it's been addressed, but there's a lot of documentation to get through, is uh, with the driveway would be right up next to the driveway that exists. And there's a plan for creating drainage, uh, which makes a lot of sense, especially given what nature has done here. Is there any concern that creating that drainage underneath that driveway might potentially undermine the dirt underneath the existing driveway at 722. And I don't know how it was built. Maybe it's already all set correctly, <laughs> but is there any potential adverse impacts to the driveway right there? Since the two drivers would be really right next to each other, right on that easement, which is probably a real natural downflow for the water. Um, if the information exists in the packet, great, point me to it. Otherwise, um, I look forward to that information. It won't make me feel like you've got to stop doing anything. I just want to make sure we're prepared for whatever's going on. That was all I had. And Thank also, you, Ms. Marquardt. Okay. Uh, next speaker, please. The next speaker is Christine Bowles. Please go ahead. Um, uh, this is Christine Bowles. I, I sent you all written comments earlier about the fire issues on this project that I had brought up before that don't seem to have been addressed. And I look forward to hearing you address those tonight. Um, I wanted to focus my comments on the HPD variance being requested, um, as that's an issue that I've been trying to study and understand with projects all over town. Um, I've reviewed 10 projects um, that, that uh, have had variances to HPD in the past. Um, of those um, four, um, only, I'm sorry, of those only four were single family homes. Uh, one of them didn't actually ask for a variance despite um, um, sorry, I'm losing my time with the dog. Um, 
one on Dardanelle, the site had already actually been previously disturbed for a water tank. Um, 200 Brandos um, applied for 18.3% disturbance and the planning commission thought that was too much. It was designed and approved for 14.4. For the project- One minute for, remaining. For the project at Talbot, I'm still waiting for the planning commission minutes from the November 2004 meeting, um, but the city council main minutes say that there was a prior study session with the planning commission. So they actually worked worked with the commission to come up with a design solution that the planning um, commission could accept. That project's on a site two and a half times the size of this one with an average slope 10% um, less, not nearly as steep. Um, and they only asked for 11% disturbance. If you read, read Jim Kramer's piece, I'm sure you see that there's a lot of discretion available to you as commissioners in determining what is reasonable use so as not to be cons considered confisc confiscatory. This is a small, very prudent piece of land. Um, and it's already not in the same category as the value of the adjacent home. So that comparison to me is, is stretched. Um, and one more thing, the exterior steps and concrete landing shown on the east side of the house on the elevations is not shown on the site plan is therefore missing in the HPD calculations. And I encourage you to fix that before you approve it so that I don't have to appeal another one. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bolt. Next speaker, please. The next speaker is Cliff Lawrence. Good evening again. This is Clifford Lawrence, uh, West Fairmont area. Um, well, uh, from the last time we talked about this, I, I had some pushback after my comments about, well, the houses are built on the other side of Talbot, so obviously uh, makes perfect sense to build it uh, on the opposite side. And I ask you, that person or persons to to really rethink that statement because there was a reason why they built on one side, wasn't there? Before the other. And now we're going to ignore those limitations and dangers that previously those people recognized uh, were a reason not to build there. That's one thing I wanted to bring up. Uh, next is, this is requiring an amendment to uh, the general plan. Uh, I've recently been instructed by reading on uh, the Office of uh, Planning and one Research minute remaining. that uh, a city has allowed four amendments to its general plan in a year. Now, I don't know if we observe that. Uh, I just want to bring that onto the record and uh, ask, uh, ask for some uh, response on that. And additionally, uh, I, I hope you do realize that you are in HPD territory here. This is severe and that the landowners below should have some guarantee or warranty of liability of, a, of any landslide that this could create to come down on them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Jim Nichols. Mr. Nichols, please go ahead. Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, yes. So Jim Nichols here. Uh, Morning Nichols is my wife. We've lived here at 700 Talbot, which is about two houses down the hill from the Murphy's proposed residence. Oh, yes. And, uh, i uh, just like to say we're in favor of them being allowed to build their home. And uh, uh, our concern used to be, you know, if there were going to be a lot of extra cars in the traffic turnaround or the circle where the fire truck turns around, but I understand there's some additional off-street off parking. So, and I'm assuming that uh, judging by the size of our foundation on this hill, that the Murphy's house will be, uh, will have like a substantial great beam, tie beam, and caisson uh, foundation, which would anchor it to that hill no matter what. So thanks very much. That's Thank it. you, Mr. Nichols. Uh, next speaker, please. The next speaker is Aaron Macias. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. 
Good evening. This is Aaron Macias. I was not planning on commenting on this hearing, uh, only on the general plan update, but I'm compelled to comment after looking up the location of the proposed project on Talbot a few minutes ago. While I emphasize with the Murphy family, this is new construction into a hillside that should have been carefully considered when shopping for a family home site. Building new construction is a long process with many challenges for anyone making this attempt. However, the point of the general plan update is to demonstrate what is appropriate and inappropriate development and land use in Pacifica. Just because a parcel is for sale and buildable doesn't mean it's appropriate use for the land. This project undermines the spirit and intent of the city goal. It is in a hillside preservation district and it contains a variance. It is an attempt to amend an operable general plan to construct in a manner inconsistent with and in violation of that current general plan. I have to question how this project can be exempt from CEQA when it abuts open space and it places a large structure on the top of a very steep slope. It cuts off an attack point for fire suppression of green space in a hillside preservation district and minute, it landlocks a green space. It also creates a more difficult scenario for defending the homes in the neighborhood from fire and increases the risk of a landslide. If you look at the two parcels, one located at 722 Talbot and one located at 712 Canyon Drive, um, it landlocks these two parcels. Uh, it landlocks the green space in the middle of those two parcels, in those three parcels. If I were an immediate neighborhood in this immediate neighbor in this neighborhood, I would be gravely concerned about the development on such a steep slope, the questionable issue of artificial rendering and last minute substitution of plants during a public hearing without the plans being provided to the staff for careful thought and analysis, its visual impact on the hillside and its permanent impact on the neighborhood, including the wildlife and its impact on the safety of both the animals and the humans in the neighborhood. Time. Thank you, Ms. Macias. Uh, next speaker, please. The next speaker is Marie Kazan Kamarik. Yes, um, I live at 620 Talbot Avenue, uh, approximately, well, uh, seven houses away from the project. And I would just like to say I would welcome the Murphys. I think it's a reasonable and modest project and um, good luck to you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kazan Kumarek. Next speaker, please. The next speaker is Terrence Carroll. Please go ahead. And Terrence, you are currently on mute. Will you please try to unmute yourself? Hi, I'm Terrence Carroll. I live at 710 Talbot, just diagonally across the street from the new planned house. And I've looked at the plans earlier and then currently the plans. And I'm a retired engineer and I see no problem in building a house on a slope like that. I also think the house is very modest and I would welcome the new neighbor just as almost all the neighbors on this street have. I look forward to them moving here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, next speaker, please. There are no other hands raised, Chair. Thank you. Well, we'll go ahead then and uh, bring the matter back from uh, public, uh, from public uh, comment and uh, just uh, I don't know, I actually one other question I guess I'll have for uh, Mr. Murdoch. Uh, was there any time of, on that 10 minutes left and was there, would it be our ordinary practice to allow Mr. Uh, Chaharia or the applicant the, the opportunity to speak to any matters raised in public comment? Yes, yes, Chair, it's our standard practice to allow up to three minutes uh, to be reserved for the rebuttal and we had plenty more than three minutes remaining uh, on the 10 minutes, if they Thank care you, to. Uh, okay, yeah, if, if, if there's any desire to, I'm not suggesting there needs to be, but uh, I'll, I'll ask the applicant. Um, from, from our standpoint and uh, to answer one of the questions of the immediate neighbor um, uh, regarding the drainage at the driveway, um, the drainage is very carefully considered. It's actually going to improve the current conditions on for uncontrolled drainage in the area. Um, we have uh, uh, velocity dissipators. We have uh, ways to mitigate some of the runoff that is currently happening there. 
so the conditions will actually be improved. Um, other than that, uh, uh, regarding the trees, uh, the Google view that the planning staff presented shows that our rendering is very close to sh representing um, those existing trees. Um, so the view as seen on the rendering uh, is very, con very consistent with the current conditions. And uh, unless you have any other question, uh, I think that would be all for us. Thank you, Mr. Anshavadi. We'll go ahead then and uh, bring the matter back to the commission. And at this point, you know, we'll uh, open it up for deliberation and for uh, uh, for comment by uh, commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Hauser, we'll start with you. Thank you, Chair. I have um, two quick questions for staff that are more clarifications. Um, so, I am I cor I'm correctly recalling and understanding that we're getting a variance from HPD here, right? We're not removing the pro the parcel from HPD. Is that Correct. Correct. So there are multiple actions required uh, should the commission want to approve this project. Um, regarding the HPD zoning overlay, uh, to address that first, it is an overlay zoning district, and it does in fact require rezoning to the planned development zoning district per the city's adopted municipal code requirements. The HPD overlay would remain in place and would not be affected by the rezoning that's proposed. However, the underlying zoning district would be rezoned to the planned development zoning district as required by the municipal code. And so it would not require a vote of the people um, and the property is not zoned agricultural. That's an incorrect statement. So uh, the current zoning would change to PD. The HPD zoning overlay would remain in place unchanged. Um, as to the variance, a variance is proposed for, for two aspects of the project. The one that I think is uh, the subject of the most discussion, at least among the public comments was the allowable coverage under the Hillside Preservation District. Coverage limitations are one of the components of HPD, among others, and they establish a maximum amount of paving, grading, and buildings uh, based on a formula uh, that's driven by the site area and the average slope of the site. And so this site, because of, it, because of its size and its slope, would be eligible for 0% coverage under the HPD formula, which on its face would say nothing can be constructed. However, there's express language in the HPD ordinance that says the provisions of the HPD shall not be applied to be confiscatory, which in plain language means to deny all economic use of the property solely on the basis of the HPD coverage limitation. And so that's why staff uh, is here recommending approval of a variance to allow coverage in excess of 0%. Uh, and in this case, you know, the amount of coverage proposed by the applicant. The commission certainly has discretion to change that amount of coverage or to conclude that a variance is not appropriate uh, for the coverage. However, staff and I suspect the city attorney uh, would want to advise you very carefully uh, on how to uh, proceed with such a decision to deny any coverage for the project site. And certainly it wouldn't be staff's recommendation to do that. So uh, the coverage that's been proposed uh, is to allow this project, a reduced amount of coverage would change the project and we should explore what that would look like uh, with the applicant uh, if possible. Uh, and there is a second variance recommended by staff, which is for the HPD's off-street parking requirement. There's also a parking exception proposed for the same deviation, and that's from the one off-street guest parking requirement, which is drafted in the HPD regulations, is intended to be one space per 10 dwelling units. And as staff has advised and analyzed and recommended, we believe that's a burdensome requirement and a variance is justified uh, for this project. However, the applicant at the commission's request has demonstrated how uh, it can provide the off-street parking space but it's in the trade-off for less landscaped area. And so that's a decision for the commission to make uh, as to which is preferred in this case. I, thank you. I, I appreciate the, um, the thoughtful answer, Mr. Murdoch. Um, and that actually leads into my second point of clarification. Um, I know at the last meeting, um, I can't remember if it was you or Ms. Agarwal, uh, gave us the details about the adjacent property that also had a variance. Would you mind taking us through that again? Uh, I will see if I have those those figures readily available. <laughs> I think they may have been in uh, in notes I'd prepared for the meeting, uh, so I, I may not be able to provide them immediately. I will do my best. Maybe uh, we can but, come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> sure, but in general terms, the project immediately next door um, also required uh, a variance from the HPD coverage. Uh, as one of the public commenters correctly stated, the site is larger and it has a less steep average slope, and so it's not an apples to apples comparison. But the findings for approval of a variance do require considering uh, 
uh, similarly situated and zoned property in the immediate vicinity of the project site in question. And so for purposes of considering an HPD variance, it's, it's probably the only relevant uh, comparison property given uh, not all of the properties in the area are zoned HPD. And that one is immediately abutting and adjacent to the project site. And so that's the reason that it had uh, relevance for purposes of considering the variance. Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, uh, I think those are my two questions for now. Um, I did want to say uh, I really appreciated the renderings that were put together, um, especially rendering two. I know it's foggy, but I think, you know, that um, I, I, I would say that I was probably the least comfortable commissioner when we reviewed this the first time around. Um, and I, I know that I had recommended and wanted to continue this. But I think especially, you know, looking at how large the adjacent home is in rendering number two compared to kind of the modest size of this home and understanding um, that we did a variance for the neighbors next door. You know, I, I would really appreciate hearing what the other commissioners have to say, but I know that that, that, that me meant a lot to me and that the Murphys went out and did the additional renderings to show that to us was very helpful. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner Hauser. Um, Commissioner uh, Damarat, we'll hear from you. Yeah, I, I concur with Commissioner Hauser about the renderings. Uh, and I wanna thank the homeowners for doing that. Uh, legally, I don't believe they were required in any permit process to have to do that. And that's something we can discuss in the future. I think it's important to see what it'll look like. Uh, but uh, for, for this, if they didn't do it, I don't think we, we could have held it against them, but I'm glad they did. And thank you so much. Uh, I guess a process question for staff, when a letter comes in as the type of letter that, that Ms. Bowles presented to us, how much time does staff have to look at that and, and draft up some kind of response? Or, so where, where do we go? And, I, and that's gonna come up in, in, you know, in another project where there was a lot of comments uh, in the last two days that you know, would, would, it's almost impossible for, for us to consider all those at a meeting like this. So, uh, and I guess the most important comment that I found, and I'm hoping, hoping I'm not uh, uh, taking out of context what, what Ms. Bull said, but it had to do with the fire issue. And I believe something about the distance from, you know, where water would be available and so forth. Um, I'm not sure if Ms. Bowles can, can stipulate exactly what she was looking for there. But I think that's a critical comment to make all of us feel comfortable about um, you know, fire issue, not only for that home and the homes in the area, but also in the surrounding hillside. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Domeret. Uh, and so uh, with regards to the fire code issue, uh, I'll take that one first. Uh, I believe uh, among the comments and requests from the commenter on that issue was a sense of the specific code requirement. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, the exception to the 150 foot distance from a fire apparatus access road uh, is found in California Fire Code Section 503.1.1. And it requires a fire apparatus access road to be within 150 feet of all portions of a structure uh, with certain exceptions. And the exceptions could include any of the following, uh, where the fire code would then be, or the fire code official rather, would then be authorized to increase the dimension and there's no uh, limit on the increase. And one of those conditions is when the building uh, is equipped throughout with an approved automatic sprinkler system installed in accordance with the sections referenced. This building would have such a fire sprinkler system to my knowledge as a new structure in Pacifica. And additionally, uh, if there are other uh, topographical or other considerations that um, would affect the ability to provide the, 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 the distance and approved alternative means of fire protection are provided uh, and then additionally, uh, there are no more than two group three, uh, group R3 or group U occupancies. And so more than one of those exceptions conditions are met in this case, um, the building would have sprinklers and it involves only one group R3 occupancy, which is a single family dwelling. And Deputy Fire Chief Sean Cavanaugh is here to speak to any other uh, fire code related questions or project analysis. I'll just note that the uh, issue of uh, wildland urban interface concerns that some of the commenters mentioned was specifically considered and discussed by North County Fire Authority uh, Deputy Fire Chief staff and the, the city's building official from the planning department. 
And their conclusion was this did not qualify as such a wildland urban interface and that additional building code uh, standards and requirements were not appropriate for this project location. And overall, there were, were no concerns related to the ability of the North County Fire Authority to respond to fires in this area, either on the project site or that this site would somehow uh, exacerbate or contribute to uh, worsening the wildland fire risk in this area. So staff did very seriously take uh, the fire risk for this project uh, and did analyze it uh, very carefully. And so with that, uh, Chief Kavanaugh, please. Yeah, that is correct. And what, what uh, Deputy Director uh, Murdoch was talking about in the California Fire Code of 50311, those exceptions uh, to the, the hydrant pool and the fire pool of 150 feet when you have a fully sprinklered uh, residential uh, um, home, that's one of the exceptions we have for that. As far as the renderings that um, I have looked at, and actually this is, I think this is gonna be through the, in my position that there's been three of us in my position that this project has gone through. And I've talked with the, the other two uh, fire marshals that were in position prior to, to my time here on this project. And as far as it comes from peace of mind for most folks, we don't have an issue with the project when it comes to a fire related issue or fire protection issue. Uh, looking at the driveway, I've looked at, we looked at the slopes. There is a hydrant uh, right now that I think is about 138 feet from where the driveway would start. A fire engine can almost pull up actually into the driveway up to the, to the front garage. Um, if, the, if the looking at the renderings. Um, so with the sprinkler and how it's sitting, uh, really is not much of a uh, concern when it comes to the, the issues when it comes to fire protection. Thank you, Chief. So Commissioner, Commissioner Domerat, uh, to the other part of your question regarding process, um, it, it's not typical for staff to prepare written responses to public comment letters that come in. Uh, what we try to do is touch on any points uh, in the comment letters that may uh, reflect uh, erroneous information presented by a commenter or uh, that would seek to undermine the findings for approval is analyzed by staff. Occasionally, you know, uh, staff does make mistakes. You know, we're human uh, as we all are. And so we try to uh, correct those when we do uh, identify a commenter that has found a mistake in our analysis or in, a, in some piece of evidence. And so uh, in this case, um, you know, we've brought an expert uh, in the case of uh, Deputy Chief Kavanaugh to address the fire related issues uh, and other issues. I don't know that they directly relate to the findings for approval, uh, in my opinion. Um, to be clear, though, uh, the commenter was correct that the dimensions on the fire hose pull from the driveway were incorrect. They are over 150 feet. But as we outlined here, that's not a fatal flaw for the analysis of this project. And I think uh, more importantly, uh, the commenters expecting uh, in some cases, a level of review for fire code compliance that's not typical at the planning stage. What the fire authority strives to do, and I appreciate them doing it, is to identify uh, fire code issues that may affect project feasibility, or if identified later in the process following a planning commission approval, could uh, prevent the project from being constructed in the way that's uh, intended overall. But all the detailed fire code compliance review is done after a project is approved by the planning commission during the uh, building permit review phase. And so we do use some judgment in trying to determine which code requirements are applicable, but they're generally higher level, um, you know, feasibility and site planning constraints um, that are, are brought into uh, this level of analysis. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch. Uh, Commissioner Gamerat, were there any other questions or comments on your part? Okay, thank you. Um, other commissioners, Commissioner Berman. I appreciate everyone's work on uh, the continuance of this project. Um, effectively, I think a lot of our previous comments were addressed or at least clarified with this resubmission. Uh, one item that I wanted to talk about, and I'm in inclined to agree with staff's recommendation is um, the parking variance. I appreciate the applicant taking a look at adding the parking stall to the site in order to not require that variance. Um, but I think the lesser of two evils is to just not install the, the parking stall altogether. Um, so I'm in agreement with that if, if other commissioners are. Thank you, Commissioner Berman. <clears throat> 
other commissioners. Commissioner Fraser. Chair, Chair Niblin, if, oh, forgive me. Uh, whenever is an opportune time, I can follow up on uh, Commissioner Hauser's request for the figures applicable to the adjacent 722 Talbot site and also touch on one other uh, HPD related point, whenever, uh, whenever you'd prefer. Thank you. Well, why don't we go ahead and take, Commissioner Ferguson, if it's okay with you, I'll go ahead and hear from uh, Mr. Murdoch real quick, then you take your comment. Go for it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Ferguson. Um, so uh, briefly to one of the public comments, um, I do see that there's a, a lack of clarity or perhaps a discrepancy between the HPD calculations uh, diagram and uh, some of the project description in terms of a, a landing for a staircase. Uh, should the commission advance with this project and, and, and make an approval action, um, the action to grant the variance is fixed at a uh, limited square footage of coverage. And so it wouldn't change uh, that issue. And we can certainly clean that up and resolve that um, at the building permit phase. They wouldn't be able to get extra coverage if that wasn't included in their calculation by any chance. And they would need to modify the project in some way to reduce that amount of coverage um, uh, if the commission was open to that approach. Uh, with regards to the 722 Talbot uh, project, uh, looking back at the minutes from the August 2nd public hearing uh, on this project, uh, I had indicated that the project was approved in the mid 2000s. Uh, that site had 0% allowable coverage with an average slope of 43.3%. The project was approved by the Planning Commission for 11.9% coverage or approximately 7,921 square feet of coverage. Uh, and that this particular project, uh, this particular request for a variance for the subject project is not out of line with those previous requests, uh, including the 722 Talbot and others that I had summarized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch, for uh, those uh, bits of information. Um, Commissioner Ferguson, we'll go back to you. I uh, feel a little bit of a disadvantage. I was on vacation during the August meeting, so I'm coming into this halfway through, but uh, thank you all for putting together such detailed reports and uh, having not requested for the renderings. The renderings are helpful for bringing me up to speed. Uh, I guess for my part, I'm not concerned with the constructability standpoint of this, which has been brought up from a few different angles. I grew up on the Filbert Steps in San Francisco. I think you could build a house on the side of a hill. Um, I, I, the only thing that brought me a little concerned was the the zoning consideration, the preservation of green space. But given that what we're talking about is uh, the parking requirement, which I, I think they've gone back and forth on, um, and coverage, which if you know the area, is, it's not at all out of scale with the other um, houses on that street. Um, if anything, it probably is one of the smaller houses on the street. Uh, and given the support of the all of the people on Talbot who called in, I guess I would be inclined to agree with Commissioner Berman and say that I uh, would be inclined to support the motion steps put forward. Thank you, Commissioner Ferguson. Um, Commissioner Leal, go ahead. Just a couple of quick comments. Um, first off, I wanted to thank the applicant for, um, for providing those renderings. I know I was one of the ones that helped provide those vantage points. And I was particularly concerned around the one from Malagro, which seeing that view, I, at first I didn't even see the new house. Um, it kind of blended in with the, with the existing property there. So, um, so first off, thank you for doing that. It sounds like it was extra work um, to get those done, but it's appreciative. Um, and then the second is I do support the staff recommendation in terms of removing the extra parking space. Um, this, Several times I've been up there that far on Talbot. Parking's never been an issue, so um, I don't think if there's extra guests that they would have an issue parking up there anyways. Um, so I would support removing that um, uh, if so desired. And that's it, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Leal. Uh, Commissioner Godwin, I'm not sure we heard from you yet. I wanted to try to give you the chance before I, before I spoke. Um, all the concerns I had about the project were covered by the renderings and the comments that were made. I'm pretty pleased with the project as it's currently set up that is a challenging lot. And I agree that the, the additional parking space is probably largely superfluous for that area. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Godwin, I guess the only thing I would add is I think I was inclined uh, at the time of the last uh, 
consideration of this matter to uh, to, to approve it. But I, I do have to say that the additional um, information, the additional deliberation has been very, uh, I think, good for the project. I I appreciate it's, uh, it's a delay. Um, it feels like a delay, I guess, because it was and uh, some additional expense uh, and uh, in, 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 in trouble. But I do believe it uh, made for a, uh, a better project, uh, ultimately, and, uh, and frankly, um, better deliberation around all of it. And uh, I think that we had the opportunity to, I, I think, address a number of concerns that the uh, community has raised. So um, again, I'm appreciative of the process, and I'm in, in support of the, the motion. And, and I, I think I would be um, fine as well with uh, uh, staff's uh, uh, recommendation as uh, Commissioner Berman first sort of, a, sort of a suggested that we just go with uh, deleting uh, the, the, space, the parking space and then uh, move forward uh, without it. So uh, with all that said, uh, Commissioner Hauser, go ahead. No, I um, I was going to say I'm ready to make a motion. If you're ready to hear one. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. Um, Mr. Murdoch, can you remind me if I'm making motion for approval one or the alternate motion? It's uh, the first one, not the first. The okay. All right. I move that the Planning Commission adopts the attached resolution to find the project exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act recommend city council approval of general plan amendment GPA-100-21 described in exhibit A to the resolution and enactment of the ordinance described in exhibit B to the resolution to approve rezoning RZ-201-18 and development plan DP-79-18 and approve specific plan SP-169-18 variance PV-526-18 and parking exemption PE-191-21 based on the project plans dated September 8th, 2021 and included as attachment E to the Planning Commission staff report, except that the approval shall not include the guest parking space in the front yard and further subject to the conditions of approval in Exhibit C of the resolution and incorporate all maps and testimony into the record by reference. Thank you for that motion. You know, I've been on the Planning Commission for about seven years now. That is probably the longest motion that... Uh, I've, I've, I've sat through, so um, well done. Um, is there a second? And we can just, you don't have to repeat the entire motion, you can just second it. Commissioner Leal. I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a motion by uh, uh, Commissioner Hauser, as stated, and, uh, and a second by Commissioner Leal. I'll ask for roll call vote, please. Commissioner Berman. Yes. Commissioner Domrat. Yes. Commissioner Ferguson. Yes. Commissioner Godwin. Yes. Commissioner Hauser. Yes. Commissioner Leal. Yes. Commissioner Niblin. Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I'm just going to note here, uh, just quickly for the record, um, there will be a couple of other matters this may apply to that, uh, again, that anyone who's aggrieved by the action of the Planning Commission has 10 calendar days to appeal the decision in writing to the City Council if any of the above actions are challenged in court. Issues which may be raised are limited to those raised at the public hearing or in written correspondence delivered to the City at or prior to the public hearing. Judicial review of any City administrative decision may be had only if a petition is filed with the court not later than the 90th day following the date upon which the decision becomes final. And the judicial review of environmental determinations may be subject to a shorter time period for litigation, in certain cases, 30 days following the date of final decision. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chavarria and the Murphys, and uh, we'll move them to the next item. Thank you, Commissioners. I appreciate all your time and help. Thank you, staff. Good evening. Um, we're going to move then to uh, new public uh, hearings, and the first new public hearing for this evening is file number 2019. 021, which is Coastal Development Permit CDP 40719 and variance PV 52719, filed by uh, Brian Brinkman to construct a new 430 square foot two car attached garage and on grade staircase adjacent to an existing uh, single family residence on a 5,000 square foot lot at 204 Sterling Avenue in Pacifica. The recommended CEQA action is a class one categorical exemption uh, pursuant to section 15301 of the CEQA guidelines and staff's recommended action to us is that we approve as conditioned. So I'll go ahead and ask uh, Mr. Murdoch for a staff report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, contract planner Ranu Agarwal will present. Uh, good evening, commissioners. I'm just going to share my screen to present a visual of, uh, of the uh, project. If uh, you give me a second here. 
So the project is a 430 square foot two car garage addition and an on grade staircase for an existing single family residence on 204 Sterling Avenue. The site is 5,000 square foot lot uh, with a general plan designation of low density residential. And the zoning is single family residential with a coastal zone combining district. The site slopes pretty steeply uh, in the front portion of the property with 40% slopes trending upward from the front property line to the front of the residence. And in addition to the single family residence, the site contains a steep driveway, which provides access to a one car parking space under a second story balcony projection on the southeast side of the building. The applicant is requesting a coastal development permit and variance. The coastal development permit is required because the project proposes more than 10% increase in bulk and floor area of the existing building on the site in the coastal zone. And the variance is required for deviation from the front setback and lot coverage standards. Um, the front setback standard in this case is 10 feet, which is allowed for garages where the front half of the parcel is um, at a 25% slope or greater, or the property's grade at the front property line is six feet or more below existing street. And the lot coverage standard is 40% uh, of the site. The um, project uh, proposes no front setback for the garage and a 42% total lot coverage. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission approve both the coastal development permit and the variance as conditioned. The findings for the two permits are discussed in detail in the staff report agenda packet pages number 168 to 174. In a nutshell, uh, the staff recommends approval of the coastal development permit because it is consistent with the city's uh, certified local coastal program and the city's uh, design guidelines. And we also uh, recommend approval of the variance because um, given the characteristic uh, and conditions of the site, the location of the garage addition in the front yard is the only feasible option. And none of the de deviations, either the lot coverage or the front setback would constitute a grant of special privilege given the characteristics of the development on several neighboring properties in the same zoning district. Additionally, this would make for a much safer street because uh, uh, it would eliminate a non-conformity in terms of providing a two-car garage where there isn't one at this time and make a better uh, situation for parking on the street. Staff also recommends that the Planning Commission find the project exempt from CEQA pursuant to Class 1 exemption, which is provided in Section 15301 of the CEQA guidelines that allow for an exemption for minor alterations to existing structures. Uh, this concludes staff presentation. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Agarwal, for that report. Um, are there any uh, clarifying questions for Ms. Agarwal uh, or for Mr. Murdoch at this time? Okay, well, I, I don't see any. So I think what we'll do is go ahead and, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Godwin. Yes, I had a couple of questions. Um, um, isn't the garage largely replacing parking that's available in the driveway on the current site? So we aren't really gaining a net of off-street parking? Well, uh, there is uh, not the potential for dry, uh, parking on the driveway because of the steepness of the slope on the driveway. There is right now one space which is under the balcony on the on the side of the building. But uh, it has uh, been uh, made uh, uh, evident by the applicant that uh, because of the steep slope on the driveway that currently exists, even parking in that space is uh, not very safe to take the car up over to that parking space. So it does uh, add one parking space in the garage and then the project is also providing for uh, another parking space in front of the uh, property um, uh, in the right of way, not, not necessarily on the paved street uh, surface, but in the right of way. And Commissioner Godwin, to supplement what Ms. Agarwal said, um, you know, 
in terms of quantitative comparison, I think you may be correct that we may not net necessarily additional spaces, but qualitatively, uh, the functionality and the safety of the spaces off the street, uh, I think would be markedly increased uh, in staff's assessment. And even the on-street space that would remain in the public right-of-way would be farther from the center line of the street and improve uh, safe circulation uh, in both directions on Sterling Avenue. That is a narrow street, but it seems like if, if you're really concerned about the safety in the driveway, you could just use chocks and, and park a car there. So it seems to me like we aren't gaining any parking spaces. If for, you know, if you're a reasonable person who's semi handy. So. Thank you, Mr. Godwin. Any other uh, comments or questions? That's all I had. Thank you. All right. Well, I think what we'll do um, then is go ahead and move to the applicant and uh, give the applicants an opportunity to, to speak to the uh, to speak to the project, and, and then after that, we'll uh, we'll, we'll take comment from the public and uh, we'll bring it back then for deliberation. So Mr. Murdoch, maybe you can help us get the applicant queued up to to speak. Yes, Chair, I'm bringing them in right now. Uh, good evening, Mr. Brinkman. Are you, are you going to be uh, presenting this matter? Yeah, I'm going to let the, the homeowner, Gary, uh, go ahead first, and then I'll follow. Sounds good. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Please go ahead. My name is Gary Slippy, and my wife, Alexandria, and I are the owners of 204 Sterling Avenue. Uh, we have lived here, lived and worked here for 25 years and owned our home for about 18 of those years. Um, as you're probably well aware, Pedro Point has many parking challenges, and our home is a great example of the problem because of our hillside location and extreme slope of our current driveway. Uh, we've lived in our home without a usable garage and really without satisfactory parking for all the time we've owned it, and we are glad to finally have the opportunity to present our proposed garage project for your consideration. We think what we have designed and proposed is well within keeping with the neighborhood. In fact, almost every home on our street has some similar type of parking garage or structure already in place. Um, and we are glad to note that all of our neighbors have indicated their support for this project. It will not only make our parking situation much safer, and but it will also ameliorate some parking congestions in, in our neighborhood. We have worked diligently with staff on this project and are glad to for, uh, their support for its ultimate design. Uh, I'm available to answer any questions you might have. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Slippy. Uh, Mr. Brinkman, uh, anything to add? Yeah, so um, like Gary said, he came to me uh, 2019. He had been uh, trying to come up with a way to make this work, obviously, um, the only logical uh, place that the garage can go is at the front of the property. So um, he knew he was dealing with an issue with, with setbacks at the front. Um, so we came up with some initial designs and brought it to the planning staff to, to get their feedback on it um, and went through a few iterations of, of concepts um, and ultimately uh, minimally sized two car garage is what um, was determined to be the best uh, fit for the site to be in conformance with the required parking. Um, we submitted it back in into 2019 and then COVID hit and he was, we were looking for a surveyor and that kind of ended up get, getting put on hold, but we started back up late last year um, and are now at the point we're at now. Um, like they said, I, I think overall, this is a, a much, uh, a big improvement to the parking situation on the property. Um, Gary's indicated before that he's had people fall down his driveway. It's so steep. He's had woken up and had cars that were parked on the driveway down across the street because they, they slid down the hill. Um, so it's just an unsafe condition and he doesn't even venture to park up in what is considered the carport right now under the deck, just because it's it's too um, too dangerous to try and get up there and end up hitting hitting a post or something. 
um, of the deck. So all in all, I think this is a much uh, needed improvement for the property and it's gonna improve the uh, street parking um, component as well. So I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brinkman. Um, if, unless the uh, unless my fellow commissioners feel differently, I think what I would propose we do is go ahead and take any um, comment from the public uh, we might have, and then we can circle back with any questions or uh, follow up with uh, the applicant. If again, if that sounds okay. Okay. Well, not seeing any disagreement, then Mr. Murdoch, we'll go ahead and uh, take any public comment. We might be able to ask if there's any. Thank you, Chair. Uh, at this time, no hands are raised for public comment. Okay. Real good. Uh, we'll go ahead then and bring the, back, the matter back to the uh, commission. Uh, and uh, I'll ask uh, for any questions or deliberation. Commissioner Hauser. Um, I think, uh, thank you, Chair. I think this makes sense. I mean, I don't, I don't see any issues and um, you know, considering the letters of support from the neighbors and that a lot of the neighbors have similar conditions on their homes, I personally wouldn't have a problem with this. Thank you, Commissioner Hauser. Well, absent any um, further questions or, or comments or deliberations, certainly a, a motion would be would, would be in order. Uh, Commissioner Wheel. Um, I'm happy to make a motion. Please go ahead. Um, move that the Planning Commission finds that the project finds the project is exempt from the California Envi Environmental Quality Act, approves coastal development permit CDP 407-19 and variance PB-527-19 by adopting the attached resolution, including conditions of approval and attachment A, and incorporates all maps and testimony into the record by reference. Thank you, Commissioner Wheel, for the motion. Uh, Commissioner Berman. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Berman. Yes. Commissioner Domerat. Yes. Commissioner Ferguson. Yes. Commissioner Godwin. Yes. Commissioner Hauser. Yes. Commissioner Leal. Yes. Commissioner Niblin. Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mr. Brinkman. Uh, Mr. Slippy, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move then to the last item. It looks like uh, under new public hearings for, for the evening, and that is um, file number 2021-018, uh, Coastal Development Permit CDP 43021, and Heritage Tree Removal Authorization for construction of a new single-family residence, garage, and accessory dwelling unit on an undeveloped lot uh, at, uh, I guess, an address to be determined on the Olympian Way, located approximately 1,450 feet northwest of the intersection of Olympian Way and Grand Avenue. The recommended CEQA action for this item is a class three categorical exemption pursuant to section 15303 of the CEQA guidelines and staff's uh, recommended action for us this evening is that we approve this uh, uh, file as a uh, condition. I'll go ahead and ask for a staff report, please, Mr. Murdoch. Thank you, Chair. Contract Planner Jacob Garcia will present the staff report. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Garcia. Please go ahead. Great, uh, thank you, Chair, and good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Jake Garcia, Contract Planner, and I went ahead and uh, put the renderings up on your screen for this project uh, for your convenience as I present. Uh, the project before you this evening proposes to construct a 3,373 square foot single family dwelling, a 434 square foot accessory dwelling unit, which is attached to a 603 square foot detached garage and a 45 square foot shed on an undeveloped lot in the Pedro Point Shelter Cove neighborhood. This project also proposes to remove one heritage tree in Monterey Pine. Uh, the proposed residential project requires planning commission review because the project site is located in the appeal jurisdiction of the coastal zone. Uh, in this area, construction, reconstruction, demolition, or alteration of the size of any structure, including any facility of any private, public, or municipal utility trigger the requirement for review and approval of a coastal development permit. This project also requires heritage tree removal authorization pursuant to the Pacifica Municipal Code uh, because the project proposes the removal of one heritage tree. Uh, additionally, uh, per the city's municipal code, 
An application for an ADU in the coastal zone uh, zoning district requires consideration of an administrative coastal development permit by the planning director without a public hearing for the ADU portion of the project in accordance with the processes detailed by the uh, Pacifica Municipal Code, section 9-4.4306M. Uh, therefore, the planning commission shall not consider the use of the ADU as part of the public hearing process for the subject coastal development permit before you tonight. Uh, staff has reviewed the proposed 3,373 square foot single family dwelling, the 434 square foot accessory dwelling unit attached to a 603 square foot detached garage and a 45 square foot shed and found that it complies with all zoning standards. In addition, the project would in staff's assessment result in a well integrated addition that is uh, consistent with the design guidelines. Uh, staff's detailed analysis of the project is contained in the staff report. Staff recommends approval of the project as conditioned. Um, a number of public comments have been received by the city and have been sent to the Planning Commission for consideration and have also been made available publicly on the city's website. Of the comments received, there were some common themes identified by staff that can be confirmed for the Planning Commission's consideration. First, multiple questions of whether the proposed project complies with development standards as it pertains to building height, lot coverage, setbacks, and need for variance. Staff can confirm that the project does not need a variance and does comply with the development standards as defined by the Pacifica Municipal Code. Um, comments were also received whether the uh, geotechnical report was repair, prepared and reviewed by qualified professionals. The geotechnical report was prepared by a qualified geotechnical engineer uh, and will be reviewed by a qualified city staff should the Planning Commission approve the project. And uh, the project applicant, Michael Cano, is also available to discuss the project. Uh, this concludes staff presentation. Thank you for your time. Both staff and the applicant team are available to answer any questions that you may have. And I yield back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcia, for that report. Um, I'll ask uh, my fellow commissioners whether or not there are any um, questions or, or clarifications that uh, commissioners may want uh, from, the, uh, from staff at this time before we hear from the applicant. Okay, I'm not seeing anything at the moment. And oh, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Hauser, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. I had a question for um, for either staff or the city attorney. Um, being that my understanding is that there is no variance requested and this is a, a residential lot with a residence proposed, I wanted to understand exactly what the job of the Planning Commission and the level of what we're reviewing actually is. Yes, Commissioner Hauser, it's a great question. Uh, and as we encourage the commission to, uh, to focus uh, when acting on permits, um, the findings for approval are really the focus of the commission's action tonight. And to take all of the evidence uh, from the staff report, uh, the written report, the staff presentation, and uh, any testimony offered by staff or the public uh, and the applicant uh, at this hearing, uh, and weigh all that evidence to determine whether or not the commission can make the findings. For this particular project, uh, the, coast, the Planning Commission's action is list, limited to uh, one entitlement, and that's a coastal development permit. And uh, it's uh, primarily focused on determining whether the proposed development, as that's defined in the municipal code, complies with the uh, city's adopted uh, and certified local coastal program. And so there's a host of policies primarily based and rooted in the Coastal Act uh, related to preservation and protection of coastal resources visual resources, biological resources, addressing coastal hazards like geotechnical hazards, and so on, including design review, uh, which we've operationalized through applying the city's uh, adopted design guidelines. So those findings are set forth in the staff report, and that's really the commission's job tonight to weigh all of the evidence and determine whether or not it can make the findings uh, for the project as proposed uh, and conditioned by staff. Thank you. Thank you for that. Very good clarifying question. Um, Commissioner uh, Damara. Um, a similar question for staff. Um, it appears that the heritage tree that will that is in question had an arborist report that said it's a dead tree. And unless I misread that, but if it's a dead tree, then it's a dead heritage stick. And why are we even looking at it as approving removal of you know, this uh, this pole, so to speak. In other words, it seems like it, once you get an arborist report that said this thing is not a viable living species of any type and it's dead, then it should have been just not even 
requested to be reviewed by by the commissioners or, or am i misreading something here well i'll first allow mr garcia to speak to uh what the arborist report says for this particular tree and while he's doing that um, i'll i'll look at the exceptions from a heritage tree permit to determine whether um, a dead tree is exempt uh, to my knowledge it's not but i'll, I'll seek that confirmation uh, but well, that is correct that the tree, um, the heritage tree that's being proposed for removal has been identified by the arborists uh, to be um, dead and overgrown with ivy um, and does recommend uh, the removal of the tree to allow for the development of uh, the proposed development of the new residence. Um, the location of the tree exists um, where the proposed driveway retaining wall and uh, patio improvements are to be located, um, but the tree is, has been identified as um, dead and in poor condition. And Commissioner Domeret, uh, the city's heritage tree preservation ordinance is codified in Title IV, Chapter 12 of the Municipal Code, and it sets forth criteria. Uh, there are six of them for evaluating a heritage tree permit. Um, it doesn't specifically exempt a dead heritage tree from the requirement for a permit. Uh, but it does allow the commission and in fact require the commission to consider the condition of the tree with respect to disease, general health, damage, public nuisance, danger of falling, proximity to existing or proposed structures, and so on. Uh, several of those have some implication for whether the tree is dead or not <laughs> as they relate to the findings. And so um, I think that's the relationship to the, the health of the tree, in this case, the dead tree. Thank you. I don't see any other uh, comments or questions at this point. Maybe we'll go ahead and hear from the uh, the applicant, and uh, I, I suppose we could probably take down this um, slide regarding the heritage tree. And uh, again, we'll go ahead at this point and hear from the applicant, and uh, maybe um, Mr. Murdoch can help us get that set up. Good evening, Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Mike O'Connell. I'm the applicant for this project. Um, I'll keep it brief so that I can I can um, preserve most of the time for, for questions if they come up. Uh, but um, we reviewed all the conditions from uh, the Planning Department and uh, Building, Fire, and Public Works, and we don't take any exceptions to those. Um, one thing that I kind of wanted to point out, um, just uh, so you understand what our thinking was when we were laying out this site is that we have sort of an unusually shaped site. It's very wide in the front, and then it kind of steps in. Um, and so we have an opportunity to do something different than what we see on um, the other houses on the street where you're sort of, you have to be attached to the garage to make this work if you're on the um, uphill or downhill side. And so what we were really going for was, can we create um, kind of a, a usable, you know, outdoor yard, which we have in the front on the southeast corner, that's also on the same plane as the main living level. So you'll notice on the street, and it's common in, in Pedro Point, is that on the uphill side, you know, you've got um, your, your garage on the ground floor, and then your backyard is way up on, you know, essentially the third floor. It's not always the same as your, you know, living room and kitchen. And on the downhill side, you sort of have the opposite problem where a lot of the houses don't have a front yard. Um, they are uh, they require decks, uh, which uh, don't do very well in this environment. So that was one of the, the reasons we liked the concrete walls to sort of provide that space. Is that you know with this environment, it won't have to be replaced in ten or fifteen years. Um, and we were able to create that space on the main floor. Um, because most of the houses on the downhill side of the street just don't have you know, a good functional usable yard. So trying to take advantage of that and, and put that in, in sort of this extra space that we've got in the front, which you know, coincidentally also provides a larger setback from the neighbor. So um, that was kind of our thinking when we were when laying out this site. And um, I'll hold the rest of my time for, uh, for questions if they come up. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell. 
I think then um, we'll go ahead and uh, take public comment on this uh, on this matter. Thank you, Chair. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Paul Toda, but before I bring him in, I just want to remind the public uh, I'm having trouble sharing my screen this evening. Uh, and so there is a three minute time limit for the public comments on this item. And I'll provide you a reminder when there's one minute remaining on your time. So Paul Toda, please go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead, Mr. Toda. So again, Paul Toda with Tree City Pacifica. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful house project. Very excited to see it. We're just concerned about the erosion from tree removal and uh, we're, we're hoping that uh, no trees will be cut down until a building permit has been issued. We're also hoping that for any heritage tree removal, there's a three to one replacement ratio, a one to one for any other tree removal or in lieu fees collected so that trees can be planted on another site. And uh, again, just concerned about the erosion. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Toda. Uh, next uh, speaker, please. The next speaker is Leo Leon. Please go ahead. Mr. Leon, please go ahead. Oh, good evening, uh, Chair, commissioners, and staff. I have a few suggestions here. And uh, some concerns. Number one, the design review LCUP hillside development on the excavation. Large amounts of cut and fill are unattractive on hillsides and can have a detrimental effect on the immediate and surrounding environment. As you know, Olympian Way has no sidewalks and is very narrow. Pedestrian use is ongoing. There is a history of trucks becoming stuck on our street. There is no truck or car turnaround on Olympian Way, and there is no outlet off of Olympian Way to any other place. So what we notice about the project is that there is no uh, enumeration of the amount of fill that's going to or cut that's involved in the project. There's numerous retaining walls that are necessary that, cris that cross, cross across the entire project on at least three levels and a wrap around on the sides as required by other conditions. So. What I'm saying is that we need to know how much soil there is so we can determine what size trucks are gonna be used and how many trips are gonna be needed to move all this soil in and out. So in order to do that, I asked that the commission added a condition of a study to determine the truck size and the number of trucks and make recommendations for project pedestrian and vehicle safety and project operations. I'll move on. Geologic map review. This, the site is mapped within an area where there has been a historic occurrence of landslide news, movement and topographic, local geographic, geotechnical and groundwater conditions that indicate the potential for per permanent ground displacement requiring mitigation. That's right out of the geotech report. So what I'm saying is there's been some conditions that have been asked for, one uh, by the Public Works Department that says, hey, we want to have an engineering peer review of all these retained structures uh, and systems that are being done in the public right away. I think that's a good idea. And I also think that it's fair that the same peer review be conducted on the rest of the project. All, the, all of the foundations have to be drilled into bedrock and so do all of the retaining walls. And there are a lot of retaining walls. Please take a look at them. So uh, that is, I ask that you add a condition that says a peer, peer review of retaining wall structures and systems located in the, pride, in the public right away and within the entire project. So I'm asking uh, for the potential, also there's a potential encroachment on a neighbor's yard that's unintentional, I'm sure, but we've got a potential there for fire safety, access maintenance. Please take a look at that. I think it'll be brought up in some other comments. And then the drainage plan. Um, Mr. Leon, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, that's your three minutes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Leon. Uh, next speaker, please. Uh, the next speaker is Gail Benton Shoemaker. Please go ahead. 
Um, my name is Gail Benton Shoemaker, and I'm speaking as a member of Tree City Pacifica. As you know, Pacifica is in the process of revising the Heritage Tree Ordinance. Hopefully this revision will make clear the definitions of heritage trees and logging operations, the ratings and reasons required to be able to remove trees, and the mitigation steps after trees have been removed. This will make your job as planning commissioners easier because you won't have to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether a tree will be replaced in a three-to-one ratio or what in-lieu fees can be paid. A city council member has suggested that a moratorium be placed on the removal of heritage trees until the revised ordinance is adopted and Tree City Pacifica strongly supports this idea. I visited the site where the removal is being proposed and it is a very steep hill leading down to the property below. Six of the trees on the Arborist Report do not qualify as heritage trees, but they are good sized trees that undoubtedly help prevent flooding on this steep property. This leads me to question the statement in the report that these trees do not contribute to the lot. Um, another confusing aspect of the report is the statement about native oak trees on the site. I was not able to see any native oaks on the property. If you do choose to approve this project, I also would request mitigation for the trees, three to one for the heritage tree, and one to one for all of the six other trees that are essential to the site at this time, and would also request that no trees be removed until building permits have been um, issued. Oftentimes there are approvals, trees are removed and then years go by. And this could be a real danger in terms of flooding on this site. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Benton Shoemaker. Uh, next speaker, please. The next speaker is uh, Ela Homsher, please go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Isla Homsher and I live at 155 Olympian Way next to the uh, proposed development. And I have a couple of issues that I've identified after looking at some of the materials. Uh, first is the potential encroachment across the public right of way and access to my side yard of my property. So our driveway like others on Olympian Way uh, is built across the public right of way before it reaches our property line. And this new development will be in that same situation. Well, in the site plan drawing that they provided to us, it appears that uh, they're gonna cross the public right of way in front of our property and then onto the new development. And if this is allowed, it would effectively cut off access in our uh, side yard and create a potential impact where that we would not actually have access to our side yard. So what we're asking is that the site plan be modified and the city approvals conditioned on the fact that, that they redraw the site plan. And you can uh, tell by looking at the site plan that you have in your plans, that how it would cut off our access. I did meet with uh, Mr. O'Connell and Mr. Mike uh, Panizzi on January 12th when they were out at the lot and I brought this to their attention. And they did say that it was not their intention to uh, encroach into the five foot setback either on the right of way or the property line. So for me, I just request that the changes be made to the current uh, site plan and so that their driveway and retaining wall design will not, uh, so we won't have a disagreement later that they will be able to build their pro project if it's approved but that we respect the right of way and the five foot setback. I also have a couple more comments, one about the size of development. I would like to clarify about the height of the project from the lowest grade point to the top of the garage. I tried to look at this by looking at the plans online, but it was very difficult. But I came up with like 40 feet height if you go from the top of the garage to the lowest grade point. So I'm curious. Okay, Okay, what the actual number is. Drainage, very important. It's, it's a big issue. And when I asked Mr. O'Connell about it, he mentioned about this 36 inch pipe that they plan to put in. But then the geo uh, forensic engineers seem to recommend something different. So I, it's something more expansive that would have multiple discharge points. Very concerned about that. And the last thing is with retaining walls, I just have questions about 
whether or not they can be built on the property line or if they need to follow the pipe that's set back and if there's drainage related to that. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Is there any other speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, Murdoch? Uh, yes, Chair, there's one other hand raised uh, by Kathy Gust. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Kathy Gust and I live at 140 Essex Way. Um, I'm at the downhill property line of the project and I'm at most risk for any adverse uh, effect. Um, I'm concerned about how the project will adversely affect my home. Um, the, I've documented and submitted um, my concerns actually. Um, the one thing, the main thing is the drainage. Um, I, the, how, the, where the water is going to flow being that there's so little undeveloped property on the site. To me, it's all gonna flow down on my property. Um, is one dissipator and one bubble up going to be enough for the property? Um, it seems like on the, in the preliminary report, they were asking for, like Isla said, many different um, um, release points for the water. But um, we already have a problem with water um, on my property, on the property below me, um, during rainy seasons, there's massive amounts of water that comes down off of the hill. Um, and I understand there's, there's problems up there also with some of the houses up there. Anyway, that's my main concern is the drainage. The other thing um, is why they pulled the house so far down the lot. Um, it seems as though if they pulled it back up a little bit toward the garage, um, which I understand you wanted to put a yard there, but if you pulled the house up a little bit toward the garage, um, maybe you can put the yard lower and maybe because there's dirt in the yard, maybe the water can dissipate in there. I don't know. It just doesn't seem like the water is going to like dissipate like they say it's going to. Um, the retaining wall by my home, I don't know like how big it is or how far away it is. One minute remaining. Okay, it's kind of um, unclear. And also I haven't seen a picture of my property line or the other property lines on the bottom of the site. It doesn't seem like that is in any of the pictures that you have. Um, let's see, um, yeah, that and, you know, there's a lot of older homes on the point who have, you know, suffered over the years with drainage issues because of larger homes built so huge on these sites above them and the water just flowing right down. Um, there's many of them actually. So anyway, that's my concerns and um, I hope that something can be done with that. Thank you, Ms. Gass. Uh, any other um Comments uh, at this time, uh, Mr. Murdoch. Uh, no other hands are raised, Chair. Well, I, I'm, I'm aware that the uh, applicant did reserve some time, so I, I think what we'll do is allow the applicant an opportunity to uh, use the reserve time and uh, perhaps address some of the matters that were uh, raised uh, in public comment. Thanks, Chair. Can I share my screen? See if that works. So just to address. Um, some of the comments we heard about. This is this is the um, issue that Isla raised about the retaining wall encroaching, not onto her property, but along her frontage. So the red line is where we'll adjust that to. So that's a minor adjustment that um, we worked out in the field. <clears throat> um, regarding the drainage, so the drainage is currently designed uh, in accordance with the city standards. So this uh, 36 inch, uh, detention pipe is sized to detain the difference between uh, the existing runoff we'd expect from the site and the new runoff, the additional runoff we'd expect from constructing the house in the driveway. Um, and so it, there's one bubble up box here, uh, which you know we can very easily add additional uh, bubble up boxes or change the dissipator structure, um, you know, to provide, you know, better equalization of that flow. 
Um, another option would be to sort of split these drainage areas into two and have um, an additional detention pipe near the top of the site that would receive runoff from the garage and the driveway and in and, and the left half of the house. Ultimately, that's got to go down the hill and and dissipate and then bubble up and you know c continue on its way. Gravity is going to do what it does, uh, but that may be one way to further uh, attenuate the flow. Um, the real solution, and this would take a lot of cooperation from the neighbors, but we'd be happy to do that, is to uh, utilize some of the existing drainage that's out there. So in existing Sussex Way, there is a ditch. It receives runoff from a pipe that uh, collects runoff from a uh, inlet in existing way. This is all Olympian. This area, um, this area here, is actually part of the old, uh, or still is Sussex right of way. So, you know, it would be relatively easy for us to install a new pipe behind Isla's house at 155 Olympian. And Isla, I called you earlier to uh, ask you about this. Uh, since we're here talking, this is my big idea. Uh, we could install that pipe. Uh, to you know, receive at least part of the flow from our site and connect it into a pipe, um, you know, to sort of, you know, bypass the um, uh, historical drainage patterns on the site, right? So, um, yeah, that's something that we'd be happy to, you know, make a good faith effort to to work that out with uh, the neighbors. It does require, you know, easements and and things like that. Um, you know, but something that we're, as the applicant, we're willing to do. Um, it would also give uh, the house at 155 Olympian an opportunity to connect their downspouts into this pipe, right? So they're not um, uncontrollably discharging water, you know, to their downhill neighbor, which is what happened. Chair, we're beyond the three minutes for the rebuttal at this point. Thank you. Why don't, why don't we go ahead then and uh, perhaps we'll have some questions for you. Um, Mr. O'Connell, as we um, as we work our way down the, the list here, so perhaps we'll again come back to, to you for open questions, uh, you know, that may come from commissioners. So I will ask you to stand by. Um, so why don't we go ahead then and bring this matter back to the commission for um, a deliberation. I'll ask uh, commissioners for any questions or, or points of um, deliberation they care to raise. Uh, Commissioner Dumra. Um, in terms of this drainage and the landscaping, has there been any consideration given to trapping some of the water for future use in, uh, you know, kind of our dry area, dry conditions, where you can use some of that trapped water for landscaping type of, of stuff? I guess that'll go back to Mr. O'Connell. Yeah, great idea. The, the problem is we get all of the water when we don't need it. So you'd have to store that water all winter long to, to use it when you need it in the dry season. Commissioner Domrod, did you have other? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner Domrod. Uh, Commissioner Hauser. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. O'Connell, this commission and city council um, have used the three to one heritage tree mitigation ratio as well as the one to one non heritage tree mitigation ratio on the past three projects that have had similar standards. Um, that looks like 12 trees that would be replaced and we asked in the past that they be 24 inch box trees. Is that something that you would be willing to do? Yeah, I was trying to clarify with Brian via text message how many trees we're already um, intending on. There's um, several shown on the landscape plan. I just haven't had time so, to help them. Um, my clarification is that there's one heritage tree and four non heritage trees on site. The other three on the report are actually not on our site. Um, so I believe that would be the three for the heritage and then the four others. So um, that would be seven. We currently only have one tree shown um, to replace the heritage tree, um, but we can we can look into that certainly. So you guys would, so I'm hearing seven would be acceptable. I didn't understand that they were on the neighbor's property. So seven would be acceptable and you'd be willing to use the 24 inch um, tree size? Sure. 
That's my question for the applicant. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hauser. Other questions, other points of deliberation from commissioners? Commissioner Ferguson. I guess this is a question for uh, Mr. Murdoch. Um, I, I like the idea of tying in drainage to the uh, existing public Sussex uh, facilities there. I, I'm not under sure I understand how you could make that a condition of approval because it would require the cooperation of probably several other parties. Um, it, I appreciate their willingness to go that route and it probably is the best way for all the parties involved, but is there any mechanism that we have for making that a condition if it requires third party involvement? Sure, Commissioner Ferguson, those are great points. I think in concept, it, it seems like a, you know, perhaps a superior uh, drainage solution. Uh, my concerns are twofold. Uh, one is legal in that we haven't noticed the project to include that scope of work, which extends well outside of the project area and involves in some cases property owned by others uh, who are not party to the current application. And then uh, just from a, a practical standpoint, I don't know that um, we would be able to uh, you know, assure that that would be accomplished as you indicated, given the number of parties that are involved. And so I would be hesitant to recommend that the commission go down that path at this point in time. Um, nothing would prevent the applicant from returning uh, with an application to include that development uh, when the conditions were appropriate. And the commission you know, may encourage him to go uh, and pursue that type of modification to the project. But I don't know that the commission would be able to approve it this evening, given the public notice that was provided for this project. Yeah, I, I would just note, I, I'm kind of in the same camp as uh, Commissioner Ferguson. I'd sure want to at least articulate uh, commission encouragement of that, uh, of that direction if um, Again, recognizing it may not be something that we can, um, you know, impose as a condition. It sounds like uh, if, if that could be feasibly done, it would be, in, that would be a superior way forward. Uh, Mr. Messenger, if you're if you're uh, trying to address this, you're muted. There we go, Mr. Chairman. If I might, uh, I, I concur with Mr. Murdoch, and I would add that it would also require city analysis of the flows and whether the facility that they're suggesting tying into can handle the flows and, and how many properties would be um, connecting to it. So I, I, I do think it's premature at this point. Understood, understood. Um, other uh, deliberation or um, or anything the commissioners wanna add with respect to the uh, project this time? Uh, Chair Nimblin, if, if I may just add, uh, some perspective on a couple of the points that were raised uh, during the commission's uh, deliberations and questions for the applicant. Um, with respect to the uh, stormwater design, um, we have uh, endeavored uh, through the conditions of approval to make sure that the project does incorporate uh, the recommendations of the geotechnical engineer. And so in one condition of approval, um, there, uh, the applicant would be required to incorporate all of the recommendations, which would include any drainage recommendations potentially including additional uh, uh, sources of outfall for the stormwater drainage. And a separate condition requires uh, finalizing the drainage plan for the project. And so we do think there is um, currently uh, measures in place to ensure that uh, the project is safely designed in terms of stormwater drainage. Um, as it relates to tree replacement, um, I continue to, to have some discomfort uh, with requiring uh, the ad hoc uh, replacement of trees at a particular ratio especially for trees that are not heritage trees. Um, currently, the city's uh, heritage tree ordinance does provide the commission discretion to require replacement plantings for removal of a heritage tree. It does not provide any such uh, auth authorization or requirement for non-heritage trees in this instance. And so I think we would need to, to, to discuss that, that non-heritage tree replacement requirement a, a bit further. Um, as it relates to heritage trees, I'm having a little bit of a hard time squaring some of the earlier conversation tonight about uh, stability of steep hillsides and tree plantings with the commission's desire for so many uh, large trees potentially to be installed on this site. Um, this is not a large site. It's, uh, you know, give or take 7,500 square feet. And uh, there are limits to, uh, you know, ignoring just the geotechnical considerations. There are limits uh, 
due to good forestry practices with the, the number and type of trees that a site can um, healthfully sustain. And so I just ask that any desire for um, replacement plantings for the heritage trees um, to maybe include a, a clause that, you know, up to uh, a particular number or ratio uh, with a recommendation of good forestry practices from a licensed landscape architect or qualified arborist or something along those lines so that we're not creating a, an unsuitable condition for the healthful development of the trees um, should the commission go that route. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch. Uh, Commissioner Hauser. Thanks, Mr. Murdoch. I, I definitely appreciate the, the um, insight and kind of the thoughtful analysis here. I think for me, um, speaking to the difference between uh, the continued item that we discussed earlier, which was kind of an untouched slope and um, a project that's proposing a lot of retaining walls um, and creating spaces where there are appropriate places for those trees. You know, I don't think a home with six bedrooms, having seven 24 inch box trees is a lot to ask. I mean, it's a lot of, it's a lot of house, right? And so that's not a lot of tree. Um, and what I appreciate, you know, I, I think, I, I wanna make sure that I'm clear that we're not requiring, I appreciate the applicants um, volunteering to, uh, to plant those trees and asserting that those would be amenable to him. Thank you, Commissioner Hauser. I don't see other hands at this point and, uh, you know, uh, Commissioner Berman. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to bring up a couple points that I think we received public comment on. And just to clarify with staff, um, to confirm the process of reviewing more detailed designs in the plans, given that we're at the planning stage of the project. I know there were concerns with um, qualified uh, structural engineering review of the retaining walls. Um, is it safe to assume that that thorough re review will occur during the building permit phase? It is. I think um, there's some work that perhaps could be done in the future uh, on the language in that particular condition. Uh, we certainly uh, include it uh, to address the city engineer's concerns about ensuring that structures in the right-of-way are safely constructed. Uh, I think that may reflect a misunderstanding in the past that um, projects in the right-of-way don't require building permits, which is untrue. They do require building permits, uh, even though they are in the public right-of-way. And so um, not only would they be subject to review for impacts to the right-of-way and traffic safety issues and the like that are in the domain of the city engineer, but they would also be subject to what may be intended as the peer review in this case, uh, which is uh, an additional level of review during the building permit review phase by the city's qualified um, uh, civil and structural engineers uh, that we have on our consultant staff that would review those for compliance with the California building code. So I think an appropriate level of review is already inherently <laughs> included with the requirement for a building permit for both retaining walls in the public right-of-way and retaining walls on private property. They're both subjected to the same structural design review. Great, thank you. And then uh, lastly, there were questions about the, um, the truck trips for effectively the haul route that's gonna be needed for the grading at the site. Um, I do appreciate that there's typically a COA, which is included with this project as well, where if there's any destruction to the public right away due to the development of this site, that the applicant will amend it or replace it. And, and so confirmation that that's true. And then also um, that the hall route for grading at the site, that's something that's also considered during the building permit process, correct? Like construction management plans? Uh, so uh, I'll need to go back through, or maybe Mr. Garcia can double check uh, which condition number relates to uh, damage by the project to the public right-of-way. Um, I'll address the traffic control plan issue and the haul route issue. Um, the city does not have a haul route ordinance re uh, requiring uh, approval of a haul route. It's something that Public Works is aware of and considering how they can address. Um, it may be within the commission's discretion potentially uh, to seek to address that point if there were specific safety issues that the commission has in mind related to 
this project and its construction phase activities. Uh, what I think is maybe more directly related to this project is requiring approval of a construction uh, traffic control plan uh, to allow safe ongoing uh, operation by vehicular and pedestrian traffic uh, with the addition of the construction related activity and equipment and any materials staging. And so uh, we have language ready, uh, if the commission would like to hear it, that we would recommend to address that traffic control plan component of the project, uh, you know, whenever it's the desire of the commission to hear that. Uh, I think now, unless anyone is opposed. Uh, so uh, with the, the chair's consent, uh, the recommended language from, from staff uh, to address the traffic control plan would be uh, a condition that reads prior to issuance of a building permit, applicant shall submit a traffic control plan that addresses construction phase, vehicle operation, and parking, as well as material staging, and that shall ensure continued vehicular and pedestrian access through and along Olympian Way, subject to review and approval by the city engineer. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch. Those are all my questions. I Thank you, Mr. Murdoch. I think that um, addresses the concerns that at least I heard from the public that weren't addressed yet. Thank you, Commissioner Berman. Well, I'm not seeing other hands. So, you know, I we're at a, a juncture where a motion would be in order, or um, or, or or any other um, uh, concerns uh, probably should be raised. Commissioner Hauser. Um, I would be happy to make the motion um, inclusive of the two um, items that the applicant uh, has volunteered, the first being the removal of, um, I'm going to call it the encroachment, although I'm not sure that that's the appropriate word, but maybe the realigning of the driveway. Yes. Um, such that the neighbor's um, side yard is uh, remains accessible from the public right of way. And someone can... Help me with that language if that's not <laughs> the right language. Um, and then with the inclusion of seven 24 inch box trees. Um, and I would suggest that, uh, you know, that they must be irrigated. And if the applicant abandons the project, having demolished the trees, that the trees are also replaced. Okay, why don't, why don't we go ahead and move forward with the motion and we'll incorporate yes. that. <laughs> okay. So those are the two things I would add. And so I move that the Planning Commission finds the project is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, approves coastal development permit CDP-430-21 and heritage tree removal authorization by adopting the attached resolution, including conditions of approval in Exhibit A uh, and incorporates all maps and testimony into the record by reference, including the two conditions that I added. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Hauser. Commissioner Ferguson. I noticed we didn't include the condition of the traffic control plan so to review by a city engineer. Is it possible to include that to the motion after the fact if it's amenable to the rest of the yeah, Absolutely. Commissioner Hauser would be open. That's perhaps that friendly amendment to uh, to include that uh, that language as well. Yes, to the chair, I'd be willing to amend my motion to include the traffic control plan. Sorry. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and so... Um, Chair Niblin, if we could uh, maybe before proceeding to uh, seek a second, uh, allow me to read some specific language to address those three points so that we have a, a clear indication of what uh, the requirements would be for the project. Okay, well, why don't you go ahead and I'll, we'll just confirm with Commissioner Hauser that that tracks for uh, the intent of her motion. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the first is uh, prior to issuance of a building permit or encroachment permit and as agreed to by the applicant, the applicant shall revise the project plans to confine the driveway and associated improvements within the public right-of-way, such as retaining walls, to within the frontage of the project site. Um, and with all of these, uh, also giving uh, Mr. Messenger an opportunity to uh, make any adjustments that uh, may be required. Uh, the second is uh, prior to issuance of a building permit and as agreed to by the applicant, the applicant shall revise the landscape plan to include installation of seven 24-inch box trees to replace trees removed by the project in a species and placement to the satisfaction of the planning director. And then lastly, uh, the, the condition language I read a moment ago, prior to issuance of a building permit, 
applicant shall submit a traffic control plan that addresses construction phase, vehicle operation and parking, as well as material staging, and that shall ensure continued vehicular and pedestrian access through and along Olympian Way, subject to review and approval by the city engineer. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch. Um, and uh, I just wanna confirm, I, I know uh, Mr. O'Connell, you had indicated earlier, particularly with respect to condition two, that that was that something you, you uh, on behalf of the owner were, uh, were, were agreeable to? That is correct. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Messenger, was there anything uh, you wanted to uh, add? I have nothing to add. All right, and Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Hauser, I'll confirm that that language then uh, tracks kind of the intent of your motion. Yes, thank you for coming up with that. That's very clear. Perfect, uh, Commissioner Damara. There was also a concern by several of the members of the public about not removing any trees until such a time as a permit is uh, provided to the applicant. So is that a realistic condition where uh, we don't want to remove anything until they're ready to construct or just before construction? Uh, well, Commissioner Dahmer, in my opinion, it's, it's a reasonable timing related condition. Uh, the commission's authorization to remove the heritage tree is necessitated by development of the project. And so should the project not have a reasonable chance of moving forward because it hasn't yet obtained a building permit, to me, removal of the heritage tree reasonably could be concluded to be premature at that point. Commissioner Hauser, do you wanna say something to that? Sure, um, as someone that does a lot of um, construction projects, the reason that I, I didn't quite include that language in there is because there are, there are lots of times where people need to get a grading permit or a site improvement permit and start work, um, you know, for example, due to rainy season requirements before getting um, a, a permit that would be like the foundation and the rest of the building. So I actually, and I, I forgot that it wasn't included in the condition. I tried to cover it with language that said, if for some reason the project is abandoned, the, those trees would still have to be replanted, the replacement trees. Um, if the applicant is amenable to the the language that Commissioner Domerat, um suggested, I would I would be happy to include it. Um, if not, I, I would suggest adding the language that I had mentioned, which is if the project is abandoned for some reason and the build the structures aren't built, that the trees are still replaced if they're demolished. Uh, Chair Niblin, uh, may I offer uh, just a staff observation on uh, this point? Sure, go uh, ahead, please. Uh, uh, Commissioner Hauser, I certainly understand the sentiment of the, uh, you know, the site preparation requirements and so forth. Um, I would just note that very often when a project doesn't proceed, it's because an applicant has had some sort of um, hardship, financially or otherwise, uh, and it would be difficult for staff to compel an applicant to replace a tree that's been removed if they, for example, are financially insolvent and don't have the means to do so. Uh, or couldn't be readily located or brought back to Pacifica <laughs> if they've moved out of the area, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, that's one practical uh, difficulty with that approach uh, as compared to uh, the other. Uh, there's certainly no guarantee a project will move forward, you know, even when a building permit's issued, but it at least allows us to get closer to that point in time. Uh, and it's demonstrated they've provided other, you know, payment of fees and so forth that suggests they perhaps have the wherewithal for the project. And the other is simply just that uh, a heritage tree once removed is not immediately replaced, right? In terms of the size and uh, what it provides to the area. So um, they're not they're not one and the same from staff's perspective. I, I yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Chair, would it be acceptable to ask the applicant um, his thoughts? Um, that sounds fine, Commissioner Hauser. And maybe Mr. O'Connell, you could speak to and what we uh, what we've been discussing here. If you have anything to add, yeah, I think it's a good idea. I wouldn't want to go strip all the vegetation off that site and let it sit there through the rainy season. So I'm fine waiting to remove the vegetation until we're ready to go. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. And and just in, by way of clarification, then Commissioner Azra, I just because I, I think um, given the hour, my my brain may be fogging a little bit. The um, would it be we'd be timing or, 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 or not uh, conditioning the, uh, the removal of the trees to uh, a point at which a permit is, uh, whether it be a, a grading permit or some other um, 
some other permits uh, that you know sort of uh, indicates work is proceeding or is that kind of what we're, we're getting at? I believe it was a building permit that would have covered the structures and not just a demolition permit or grading permit. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Berman, I see your hand is up. Thank you. I, I'm not opposed to where this discussion is going, but I do want to add consideration of good forestry practices. If I recall correctly from the Arborist report, several of the trees on this site are in poor condition, which oftentimes is more hazardous to keep them rather than to remove them, you know, under the watch of an arborist. So I think this is one of those sites where having dead heritage trees stay there could be more harmful than not. Thank you for that uh, you know, perspective. I think that's very helpful. Well, Commissioner Hauser, again, you are kind of the owner of the motion. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it back to you and and ask you. Uh... Sure. Um, so I I think that's a good point. I think I'm I'm inclined to leave the mo the the motion as it currently is without the additional language. And maybe we add some language about good forestry practices if Mr. Murdoch thinks it's appropriate. But other, I mean, I'm I'm happy with where it stands now. Excellent. Well, we've got the motion as it stands, and uh, I guess maybe I'll ask if there's a second to the motion as it, as it stands currently. Uh, Commissioner Ferguson. Yeah, I would second the motion as it stands. Thank you. So we've got Commissioner Hauser's motion, motion that's been seconded by uh, Commissioner Ferguson. So I think what I'll do is ask for a roll call vote then on the motion. Commissioner Berman. Yes. Commissioner Domerat. Yes. Commissioner Ferguson. Yes. Commissioner Godwin. Yes. Commissioner Hauser. Yes. Commissioner Leal. Yes. Commissioner Niblin. Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. Well, that then will take us to um, communications. And the uh, first uh, item of com communications is for uh, commission communications. I'll ask if any. Uh, Commissioners have, <clears throat> excuse me, com, uh, communications for the, uh, for the commission. Uh, Commissioner Berman. Thank you. Uh, I want to just officially thank staff and, and everyone at the city who has put all their time and effort into rolling out the, the draft plans that um, came out, was it a week or two ago? But... I think a lot, and me and several of the commissioners here, um, John, I know you're one of them for sure, had many meetings about those plans and, and they've been a long time coming. But regardless, we did receive some public comment during the oral communications um, segment of this meeting that kind of asked, it sounds like the public is, is concerned with the amount of outreach and the timing of release of the draft plans and then the close period for public comment. Um, Deputy Director Murdoch, do you mind speaking to kind of the process and the history of the plan development? Uh, sure, Commissioner Berman. Um, you know, I'll keep it at a high level given we don't have an agenda item on this topic specifically. Uh, but I'll note that uh, the city has been working since 2009 to update its general plan and local coastal land use plan. It has come close uh, on more than one occasion, <laughs> only to be sidetracked by other uh, economic issues or competing uh, political and other priorities. And so uh, we're making another earnest attempt uh, to get across the finish line for the general plan. Uh, the city did approve the uh, local coastal land use plan update in February of 2020. And we're working uh, ongoing with the Coastal Commission towards certification of that document. Uh, and what's exciting uh, in this latest release is we've also prepared a new Sharp Park specific plan for public review and comment and an updated draft e uh, environmental impact report or EIR uh, to cover both the general plan update and the Sharp Park specific plan. And so uh, what we've provided for is a 45 day public comment period on the draft EIR which is the minimum period uh, required by state law, uh, and it's adequate under state law for review and comment by the public and other agencies on a draft environmental impact report. 
Uh, the public's opportunity to comment on the draft general plan and draft Sharp Park specific plan is ongoing. They are not confined to the 45 day comment period. Uh, and so uh, while we encourage folks to submit their comments as early as possible to give us the fullest opportunity to consider them, the public does have more than 45 days to comment on the draft general plan and Sharp Park specific plan. Great. That was a great clarifying measure that actually I wasn't keeping track of. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Berman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Murdoch, for, uh, for that clarification. Uh, Commissioner Godwin. Yeah, I too wanted to thank everyone who participated in developing the general plan. I think it's what I've read of it so far is an impressive document and quite pleased to, for the little bit I've been able to participate in it. My second point is if people aren't aware, because I don't think it was widely publicized, the Postal Service is now delivering one shipment of four free COVID tests per residential address. And But you do have to request it. All you've got to do is go to the, the Postal Service website slash COVID test, fill in your address, and they'll be on your way beginning the end of the month. So I encourage everyone to do that as well. Thank you, Commissioner Godwin. I don't see another, uh, any other uh, commission uh, communications for this evening, so I'll go ahead and move to a staff communication. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as Commissioner Berman pointed out, uh, we have exciting news that the city has released uh, public review drafts of uh, draft environmental impact report, general plan update, and new Sharp Park specific plan for the West Sharp Park neighborhood and part of East Sharp Park. Um, we uh, call that effort, the combined effort, uh, Plan Pacifica. So you may hear different ways to describe those, uh, those three documents or the city's two, two planning activities uh, under that moniker. We have a website, planpacifica.org. Uh, we released the documents on the evening of January 7th and the 45 day public uh, review and comment period on the draft EIR runs through February 21st. And so we encourage folks to get their hands on those documents as early as possible. Uh, get working on them uh, and uh, to submit your comments in writing. Uh, instructions for how to submit the comments are provided on planpacifica.org. And so we encourage everybody that's interested to go and take a look. Um, and as I mentioned, the, uh, the community does have a, a longer opportunity to comment on the draft general plan and draft Sharp Park specific plan. Uh, and the other update I wanted to provide is uh, we're very excited to welcome two new staff to the planning department. Uh, one started last week and one started today. <laughs> so it's uh, it's much needed uh, assistance and support for uh, our hardworking planning team in the planning department. Uh, we welcome associate planner, Helen Gannon. You may recognize that name. She uh, worked for uh, roughly three years as an assistant planner, uh, pursued a promotional opportunity in another city. And we were lucky to be able to grab her back <laughs> and get her back on the Pacifica team um, at a, a pro promotional level as well as an associate planner. And we welcome assistant planner, Jamie Mosler, who uh, has prior experience working as a planner in the city of Sacramento. And so we're uh, excited to, to welcome or welcome back <laughs> those members of our planning team. And hopefully you'll have an opportunity to see them uh, at an upcoming planning commission meeting. That's that's great news. Yeah, we have a uh, first experience working with Helen and frankly, the county as she was a, a planner at Sunnyvale County and uh, before coming to Pacifica. So we've got a really good experienced person there. I'm looking forward to meeting uh, uh, J.D. Mosler, who I, I guess is new to us. So that's, that's really new to us. So that's great. Um, I guess that's uh, staff communication. And uh, I actually did have one question, Mr. Murdoch, if I could uh, circle back regarding the um, Plan Pacific uh, documents. Are there hard copies of those documents available anywhere if uh, somebody uh, is having difficulty navigating uh, online? Yes, Chair, there are. And so we have hard copies of all three documents, the draft environmental impact report, the Sharp Park specific plan and the general plan uh, at the planning department at 540 Crespi Drive, uh, accessible during normal business hours, which is posted on the planning department webpage at cityofpacifica.org. We also have printed copies at the Sharp Park Library and the Sanchez Library uh, during those uh, libraries' respective operating hours as well. Thank you. So that then will take us to adjournment. Uh, could we, uh, is there a motion to adjourn uh, this evening's meeting? Uh, Commissioner Berman. I move that we adjourn the meeting. We have a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Uh, Commissioner Leal. I'll second the motion. Great. Thank you. Can we get our roll call vote, please? Commissioner Berman. 
Yes. Commissioner Domerat. Yes. Commissioner Ferguson. Yes. Commissioner Godwin. Yes. Commissioner Hauser. Yes. Commissioner Leal. Yes. Commissioner Niblin. Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we're adjourned. Everybody have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.